the conducting, so it's going to be a really great afternoon for us and the viewers. <laughs> scientifically prove the end result of riding a bicycle against traffic. The average car weighs 6,000 pounds. The average bicycle with rider weighs 170 pounds, give or take a few. A typical car traveling 35 miles per hour has 220 times the momentum or energy of a bike rider traveling 10 miles per hour. And if the two collide, bug splatter. Avoid being bug splatter. Ride right, stop at the light, watch the road. Hey, buddy! Don't you know you should never leave a cooking pan unattended? And a working smoke detector can warn you of a fire! Like the one behind me! <laughs> My hero! Next time, listen to the ball. Have a smoke detector and a fire extinguisher that work. How'd you know? The ball called. Welcome back to Aging Well in L.A. Today's program is from the Los Angeles Music Center, where the Los Angeles Opera has invited senior citizens to the final dress rehearsal of Verdi's opera, Regaletto. We will return to the stage of the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion in a moment. But first, today's visit to Caregiver's Corner. Oftentimes, as caregivers, we put ourselves at the end of the list. We don't take care of ourselves as well as we should. And yet it is important, like the example we're given when we go on an airplane, of putting the oxygen mask on first before you help others. It's a similar concept in family caregiving. You do have to take care of yourself before you start to help others. So one of the ways that we suggest you do that is by making a weekly plan for you, a very specific plan, a plan that will help you stay focused on making time for yourself. I know you're saying, no, no, I don't have time for that. I'm already overwhelmed with everything else. The real issue is that you must make time for yourself. Make time. You start by doing something like determining what is something you want to do, not something you should do or someone else thinks needs to be done, but something you want to do. It could be something as simple as being out in the garden for a little bit and gardening, or going to sit near the water fountain out in the park, go golfing, whatever it is that you like to do. You need to find something that you want to do. Then you need to make a specific plan about when you're going to do this. Are you going to do it Tuesday around 1 o'clock after your care receiver has had lunch and is resting? Are you going to do it on Saturday morning? Find a specific time that you're going to do this and determine what you're going to do once you're there. Are you going to just sit and enjoy the water fountain? Are you going to take a couple magazines with you and finally get to go through them? Figure this out and be very specific so that eventually your plan for the week is on Tuesday I'm going to go to the water fountain at the park on Tuesday afternoon about two o'clock I'm going to sit there for an hour and a half and read my magazines once you've made your plan then look at it and think okay how confident am I that I'm going to be able to do this I'd say I'm at a confidence level of eight because I think I can get somebody to come and stay with mom while I go do this now, if your confidence level is less than a six, maybe you need to rethink it. Make it more bite size. So instead of planning on going both on Tuesday and Saturday, just decide which day is better and make it for one day so that you really can achieve your goal. You'll find that if you make a weekly plan for you and stick to it and avoid canceling out on yourself, it will really make a difference in how you care for yourself, 
for your care receiver and for the entire family. It will make a difference. And now, let's return to the stage of the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion and join senior citizens from all over Los Angeles County enjoying the final dress rehearsal of Rigoletto by Giuseppe Verdi. like this for the seniors today wouldn't be possible without the help of volunteers like yourselves. Tell me, what got you involved with Los Angeles Opera? When I retired from work and I had friends that were volunteers here with the Opera League and they said, oh, you must come, you'll love it, and I can tell you I have thoroughly enjoyed it. And I met some of the most wonderful people. Just, just a lot of fun. We do a lot of things for the Opera League here. We feed the cast. We uh, work in the boutique shop, we have an education department, and bringing the seniors and the students here is absolutely wonderful. And we visit and talk with them, make them feel welcome, and then after we all do all that, we go get to even go to see the author, which is great. Oh, that's excellent. Now, I understand some of you actually go out to the senior centres and teach the seniors about the opera before performances like this. Somebody do. do. Somebody yeah. does. Some of them. Yeah, we're not involved in that aspect, mm -hmm. but there are some. Mm -hmm. it, there's so many departments and things, and the different ones do different things. Mm -hmm. Now, Claire, how long have you been volunteering here? Five years. Five years. <laughs> Five, and you've loved every minute. I love every minute of it, and I met the wonderful people. So you can recommend to seniors, or in fact anybody that's got a few spare hours on their hands, to come along here to opera and volunteer? Oh, yeah. yeah. We always need volunteers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they would just get in contact with the opera mm -hmm. here, and, yeah. uh, and I guess they have a whole department that deals yeah, with volunteers do. and helps. Um, I, I'm sure you have to go through some training process as well. Well, depend yes, you do for what you're going to, whatever particular area you're going to be working in, yes. Excellent. Just a great staff here. Wonderful staff Wonderful here at the people. Music Center. Wonderful. Great. Thank you, ladies, so much. Um, I know you're busy today, so thank you so much for spending a few minutes with us. Have a wonderful day. Oh, what's really thank you. fun is, is talking to the uh, uh, seniors here. So they have a 103 year old lady here that sings oh, so goodness. many offers. She's yeah. gone, but okay. she was a delight. Uh -huh. I know, people are so appreciative of yeah. this chance to come yeah. along. Um, yes. And we really appreciate what LA Opera does for the city's yeah. seniors. <laughs>
Calamari. She's a program manager with SRO Housing, and she is with our senior program. Lillian, it's just so great to be here today. Mm -hmm. um, is this the first time SRO Housing has had the chance to come to see you after? No, we come here whenever we can. I, I try to apply to get us in. We come about every other year we're here. Now, um, the seniors you work with generally are very low-income seniors. Yes. Um, they have a whole number of challenges that they're facing mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. Tell me, how important are programs like this for them? It's very important to them. It's, they love to come here. It's a nice uh, venue for them to, to participate in. We show them uh, films of the opera before they come. We give a presentation. They really get excited about coming here. They love coming to the opera. Yeah, it's a very important task for them yes. to see live performances that perhaps they couldn't really afford to come along That's in, right. the, in the general scheme of things. That's right. And um, I rode the van up here with the seniors, and one senior was talking excitedly about how he had gotten uh, a video from the library and watched it before, before they came. And um, they just really get into it, and they get books in the library about it. We present them information and educate them about the opera but um so it's much more than just the afternoon itself. Yes, they they love to study it before they come. They're they're very excited about venues like mm -hmm. this. I also take them to the museums. They love the museums yeah. as well. Yeah, it's also a great social opportunity for mm -hmm. the seniors, really from all over the county of Los Angeles, to yes. get together at events like this. That's right. How many seniors have you brought here today? We brought like 22 seniors with us today. And um, is it just a case of applying for the tickets, or is there a little bit more to it than that? Well, the yeah, when they need to sign up, we need to sign them up, and um, again, we have to educate them on the opera. We want them to know what they're seeing. They they love to learn about things. Uh, they love education, and this is another education opportunity for them to to learn something. And I think, especially with the cuts in education for adults, and certainly in programs that seniors can participate right. in for educational opportunities, opportunities like this are very rare, yes. um, and we really need to support them as much as we can because we want them to carry on for many years, and you know, to have many seniors from all our senior centres mm -hmm. coming along and getting this opportunity. Lifelong education is very important for seniors. It keeps their minds active, it keeps them active, it keeps them interested in life. It's a very important thing. Now, Lillian, I know you're also an art teacher. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I know, because we, every year we have our senior art exhibit at the City Hall in the Bridge Gallery there, and some of Lillian's participants at her classes, mm. they enter their works in our mm -hmm. annual exhibition. Yes. So, also, tell us a little bit about that. Well, it's an art workshop I started 18 years ago when I first started working down on Skid Row. There were no programs. There were no art programs or education programs for the people. So I just went to one of the uh, the uh, uh, shelters and asked them if I could set up a little art workshop. And they said yes, and I did. So like four or five years I was teaching in the shelter. And then uh, the company I work for, SRO Housing Corporation, they wanted me to move it to to, to our property, and they gave me a loft for the artist to work in. It was very nice. Yeah, and they're producing some amazing work. Yes. Really, multimedia work, amazing work. Yes. And it's really just so important how important the arts are mm -hmm. to seniors in their everyday lives. That's absolutely, absolutely. It's very important. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
absolutely fantastic. From everyone here at Los Angeles Opera and for Aging Well in LA, thank you for watching and we'll see you next time. are pretty much a sure bet. Some things are predictable. And some things you just don't know unless you have ESP, an emergency survival program that prepares you for emergencies or just the plain old unexpected. You can't predict, but you can prepare. Disaster strikes without warning. What if life as you know it has completely turned on its head? What if everything familiar becomes anything but? Before a disaster turns your family's world upside down, it's up to you to be ready. Get a kit. Make a plan. Be informed today. Channel 35. Your city, your channel.
Good morning, Los Angeles, and welcome to the City Council meeting for Wednesday, March 23rd, 2011. Thank you to Council Members who are here, Council Members Cardenas, Hahn, Kretz, Perry, Wesson, and Zine. Uh, Mr. Wiesar and Mr. Reyes are excused today, and Mr. LeBonge is coming in uh, a couple minutes late. So uh, the following Council Members are unexcused and late right now if they will make their way down to Council. Council Members Alicone, Krikorian, um, Parks, Rosendahl, and Smith. Uh, we do have seven members now, and we're waiting three more of our 15-member body to constitute two-thirds of our body or a quorum and to begin business. Thank you to those folks who have joined us here uh, in City Council Chambers today, our city employees and members of the public. We appreciate the work that you do and appreciate your presence here as well. Um, we are broadcast live on Channel 35, each of these meetings, and rebroadcast uh, each evening as well. We're also available online through lacity.org, uh, where we have live streaming webcasts of our council meetings, and we archive our past council meetings there for your convenience. Online, also, you can find our agendas, which are made public uh, 72 hours in advance or 24 hours in advance for our special meeting items. Uh, those are also posted in city buildings. And uh, you can come to the council in two other ways or listen to the council in two other ways through your telephone by calling 213-621-CITY. That's 213-621-CITY. And you can listen into our council meetings or our committee meetings. Uh, or you can come to our remote facilities in Van Nuys or San Pedro, if that's closer to where you live, and testify from there or just listen into the council in those city council chambers. Um, we have our agendas available in the back today. If there are any items that you'd like to talk on today, uh, items are split into items that have had hearings in committee and those that have not yet. Items that have already had their hear public hearings in committee uh, require a council member to reopen those or else we uh, only have council member discussion of those. Uh, any items that have not yet, though, had hearings are automatically triggered by cards from the public. And we also have general public comment for items not on our agenda but nevertheless under our jurisdiction. So just feel free to sp fill out a speaker card in the back and hand that to one of our sergeants at arms and we'll be sure to hear your comments. Uh, again, this is, uh, it is now after 10.10, Council Members Alicorn, Krikorian, Parks, Rosendahl, and Smith. We are awaiting your presence. If we do not get a quorum by 10.15, we'll have to cancel the meeting. So please, uh, if our sergeants at arms will assist us and if we can get down to be respectful of the people's time here, thank you and we'll begin shortly. Mr. Cardenas. Um, yes, like who's excused uh, from council at this time? Uh, we have count, uh, excuses from uh, council members Wiesar and Reyes. Mr. LeBond is excused to arrive late, and then we have excuses to leave early for council members Alicorn, Cardenas, and myself. Thank you. Thank you to Mr. Rosendahl. We do have a quorum. Mr. Clerk, if you'd like to call the roll, please go ahead. Alarcon, Cardenas, Hahn, Wiesar, Koretz, Krikorian, LaBanche, Parks, Perry, Reyes, Rosendahl, Smith, Wesson, Zion, Garcetti, 10 members present, and a quorum, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, first order of business, my understanding, colleagues, is that tomorrow is Council Member Krikorian's birthday. We're not meeting tomorrow, but we wanted to wish him a very happy birthday, and we hope that it's a good celebration. Yes, exactly. That's why we, we have all the seating here <laughs> for you. But a very happy birthday to you, Council Member. We hope it's a good one. First order of business, please. Approval of the minutes. All right, Mr. Cardenas moves and Mr. Smith seconds without objection. That'll be approved. Next order of business. Commendatory resolutions for approval. Mr. Kretz moves and Mr. Parks uh, seconds without objection. Those will be approved as well. We can run through the agenda and colleagues, if you will please uh, direct your attention to the agenda for any items you'd like to call special. First items, please. Mr. President, item, item one is an ordinance notice for public hearing. Would you like to hold it on the desk until 12 members are present? Yes, please. Let's hold that on the desk. Items two through five are street vacation hearing protests. Notice for public hearing. Okay. Uh, I do not see cards on any of these. Do we have cards on any? No, sir, we do not. Okay, we'll close the public hearings on those. Any specials? Two through five, colleagues? If not, let's go ahead and prepare the roll and tabulate the vote. Eleven eyes. Okay, that is approved. Next item, please. Item six through... Excuse me, items six through nine are items for which public hearings have been held. There is a request from member to continue item seven to March 29th. Okay, without objection, we'll continue that till next Tuesday. A committee report for item six has been submitted and distributed for council's consideration. All right, Mr. Parks calls that special. Number six. Yes, thank you. Anybody wishing to call number eight or nine special? If not, let's go ahead and take up eight and nine. Please prepare the roll. And tabulate the vote. Twelve eyes. That is approved. Um, we'll hold one special for cards, even though we have twelve members. Let's go to the next items, please. 
Items 10 through 14 are items for which public hearings have not been held. Ten votes are required for consideration. There's no objection to consideration. Those are before us. Mr. President, there is a request from member to continue item 14 to March 30th. Okay. Without objection, we'll continue item number 14 till the 30th. And uh, any specials? We'll close the other public hearings. There's no cards uh, 10 through 13. Um, we'll close those public hearings. Anybody wishing to call the special from the council? Seeing none, let's go ahead and prepare the roll on 10 through 13 and tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Okay, that is approved. Next item, please. Mr. President, item 15 is an item scheduled for closed session. Would you like to hold it on the desk? Yes, we'll hold that on the desk. Okay. And if we can call the roll on the special meeting, please. Alarcon, Cardenas, Hahn, Wezar, Koretz, Krikorian, LaBanche, Parks, Perry, Reyes, Rosendahl, Smith, West, and Zion, Garcetti. Twelve members present and a quorum. Mr. President. Okay. Anybody wishing to call 16 special? We have a card, but there's been a public hearing. There's no motion to reopen the public hearing. We'll put that in the record. If nobody wishes to call 16 special, let's go ahead and prepare the roll on 16. Uh, excuse me, sir. Uh, yep. 16 is an item for which a public hearing has not been held. Ten votes are required for consideration. Has not. I'm sorry. I have, I have it written here that it had been held. But we'll ask Arnold Sachs then to come forward on item 16 for public comment. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, Good morning, Mr. Sachs. Good morning, Mr. President. Just at a point of clarification, didn't you have to adjourn the regular meeting before you entered into the special? No, vice versa, sir. Excuse me? A vice versa? Okay. Um, memorandum of understanding between the redevelopment agency and the DWP. The problem, again, with these contracts is that it's uh, providing $400,000 for a three year term with an option to it to extend up to two additional years. So, does the $400,000 cover three years? Does the $400,000 cover the five years? And if it doesn't cover the five years, because further on it says, including $500,000 in LAP, LADWP funds uh, in budget line economic development opportunities for the citywide non-housing work program. The problem there is that $500,000 isn't for that program. Only $400,000 is for that program. $100,000 is for the administration of the program. So again, it's all in the wording. It's always in the wording. It's always something that you have to look for. So is it $100,000 for five years, which is $20,000 a year to administrate? Or is it $100,000 for three years, which is $33,000 to administrate? Could you please clarify that for your constituents, the people that you represent? Maybe one or two or a thousand or whatever might want to know because they're going to be dealing with the fallout from the $400,000, $400 million budget deficit. Thank you. And Mr. Sachs, I, I hope you take this the right way, but I know that you sometimes just read the summary. The supporting materials give you all that detail, and that is made available to anybody in the public, including yourself, to be able to see what the span of that is and those details. So appreciate the comment, and I just want this is not to respond to, sir, but that is available for every person in this audience and anybody online, and it's also available over here if anybody would like to read it. Thank you very much. With that, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing. Mr. President, for clarification, uh, there is a staff report from the Chief Legislative Analyst uh, yes. on this item that has been circulated. Okay. Let's go ahead and we'll move that. Please open the roll. Close the roll and tabulate the vote. Twelve ayes. Okay. That is approved. We will adjourn the special meeting, come back to the regular meeting, and we'll go through our comment cards. We'll start with general public comment. And uh, I'd like to invite Monica De La Torre to come forward as our first speaker. Good morning. After that will be uh, Michael or Mikhail Waters. Good morning, members of the council. Good morning. You have reached 911. All operators are busy. Your call will be answered by the next available operator. Please do not hang up. Usted ha llamado a la policía de Los Angeles. Todos los operadores están ocupadas. La próxima operadora disponible contestará su llamada. En el futuro, llame a 1-877-275-5273 para llamadas que no sean de emergencia. Gracias. 
My name is Monica De La Torre. I'm a police service representative, widely known as a 911 operator, police dispatcher for the City of Los Angeles, LAPD. Ladies and gentlemen of the City Council, here we stand. We are not police officers, we are not firemen, we are the nameless, faceless civilian operators that are the first line of contact. When you dial 911 from your landline, when you dial 911 from your cell phone. We are the civilian employees who are the vital to the safety of the citizens of Los Angeles and the police officers of the department and we are taking furloughs. We are here this morning to identify how the imposed furloughs are affecting efficient emergency services to the public and the safety of police officers on patrol and outline why police service representatives working the metropolitan and valley dispatch centers should be exempt from furloughs and or any impending labor concessions. It should be understood that when emergency services are in need, if you do not reach a 911 operator, you will not get police response. If you do not reach a 911 operator, you will not get in contact with the fire department. As for mentioned, we are the first line of contact for emergency services. Thank you, and thank you very much for your service. Michael Waters is our next speaker. After that is Jorge Rios. Good morning, sir. Good morning. I'm Police Service Representative Mikhail Waters. Once furloughs were imposed, service levels decreased for calls received via 911, putting emergency response for those callers in jeopardy. In order to adjust to the constraints furloughs have placed upon 911 services, modifications were made to deploy the majority of staffing to answer 911 calls. This resulted in below minimum staffing to answer non-emergency calls and calls received from Spanish-speaking citizens, which in turn posed another problem. During busy periods, our phone system is designed to filter the overflow of 911 calls to the non-emergency queue and the Spanish queue. When this occurs, these calls will receive priority over other calls. However, when every non-emergency operator is not available handling non-emergency calls, that 911 caller will remain on hold until an operator is available. It also leaves Spanish-speaking callers at a disadvantage of receiving prompt emergency services when placed on hold longer, while that Spanish-speaking operator is handling the 911 calls placed at a higher priority. According to call statistics, these calls can hold for over 60 seconds. The, stati the statistics only indicate up to 60 seconds, but in actuality, that caller could be on hold considerably longer. While these callers are on hold, a citizen could be having a heart attack. A citizen could be holding helplessly while their house is ablaze. A criminal could have an increased opportunity to flee. A child could be choking. And victims of tragic traffic collisions could be waiting with bated breath for paramedic assistance. Essentially, the attempts to adapt to the imposed furloughs create a domino effect of problems which all lead to city liabilities and hinder the safety and welfare of the public. In addition, PSRs are placed under pressure to answer and complete calls more efficiently in the quest to service the community more efficiently and answer the multitude of calls increased by furloughs, operators may inadvertently fail to receive pertinent information. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your service as well. Jorge Rios is our next speaker. Is Jorge Rios here? Okay, uh, Valerie Covington. Like to speak? Wait. <laughs> okay. Thank you for being here. We'll make sure that these names are in the record as well. Amiana Pace. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. My name is Miana Pace. These pressures that furloughs have placed upon PSRs can result in inept service, which compromise officer safety. In the police department, we have 21 patrol divisions and four traffic divisions. Each division requires an operator at all times. Each division can have up to 40 to 50 officers working per watch. On occasion, a task force is formed to combat a specific issue in a community, which also may require an operator on occasion. When deployment is compromised due to furloughs, one operator is required to work 
two radio frequencies simultaneously. One operator handling officer emergencies, keeping abreast of each officer's status, and handling miscellaneous requests for up to 80 to 90 officers. The increased workload and decreased workforce is taking a toll on the physical health of each operator. High stress, repetitive strain injuries, and the like are on the rise. Increasing injuries on duty also place a greater fiscal strain on the city. There are nearly 60 million citizens in the city of Los Angeles and the San Fernando Valley. There are over 9,000 sworn officers in the police department, yet there are just over 400 police service representatives assigned to the Metropolitan and Valley Dispatch Centers servicing the multitude of citizens and sworn police personnel. The number of operators required to adequately sustain the operation of the dispatch centers have been decreased due to the furloughs and the citizens are aware. Just last month at a town hall meeting in Studio City, a citizen complained of waiting nearly 10 minutes on hold when a 911 call was placed. Chief Beck conceded this point and explained to the citizen that budget cuts were to blame due to furloughs on 911 operators. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Peretz? I don't know from a, a point of parliamentary procedure whether we in any way are able to address this, but uh, I for one was not aware that 911 operators were being furloughed, and I don't know if there's a way to ask that question of uh, our CAO. We, we uh, can discuss a number of things during the financial status report that may touch on that. During general public comment, we can only very briefly respond under the Brown Act. So okay. don't take any of so, our silence, so, please. As so perhaps we can discuss that. Not being able to hear that, but it's just under this is for items that are not on the agenda today. Um, but we certainly can bring that up in the financial status report. I think it touches on that. And uh, you, can, you can take that initiative for sure, Mr. Kretz. Um, Anthony Rivers like to speak next? After Mr. Rivers, uh, David Diaz will be our next speaker. Good morning. Good morning. My name is PSR Anthony Rivers. As elected officials, the safety and well-being of your constituents and police officers should be your top priority. In the event of an impending catastrophic earthquake, domestic terrorist attack, or other unusual occurrence, will the 911 centers be adequately staffed to handle the influx of calls and needs of the city? No, they will not with the currently imposed furloughs. Ladies and gentlemen of the City Council, you cannot put a price on safety. Last year, the dispatch center received nearly 4 million calls on 911, non emergency and Spanish lines, excluding alarm calls received from alarm companies, outside agencies, and a litany of calls from within the department. You must be proactive, not reactive. A proactive response will keep the city prepared for what may be ahead. A proactive response will limit the exposure of fiscal city liabilities. We implore you to exempt the police service represent, correction, representatives of the police department assigned to the Metropolitan and Valley Dispatch Centers from furloughs and or impending labor concessions. If it is your intent to keep the integrity of emergency services as safe as possible from current financial limitations, police service representatives assigned to both dispatch centers should also be included, for we are essential to the success and the effectiveness of the police and fire departments. For the sake of public service and for the sake of public safety, thank you for your time. Thank you very much and thank you for your service as well. Our next speaker is David Diaz. After that is Alex Diaz. And then we will go to Van Nuys for some speakers before coming back here. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, I'm David Diaz. I'm a plumber with Plumbers Local 78. I'm in support of the football stadium because um, it will bring back jobs, get me employed. I've been out of work for a year and a half already. And it will really bring back the economy to L.A. And uh, I would just ask you guys, please support this project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate your words today. Alex Diaz. After that, we'll go to Van Nuys and we'll hear from David Mendoza.
morning, sir. Good morning, City Council. Um, I'm Alejandro Diaz. I'm also a plumber from Local 78, and I'm also in support of the football stadium. And I've been out of work for um, two years. I'm on the last unemployment extension, you know. So, if football stadium being worked back, you know, construction working back to work. So, um, please support the stadium. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we'll go to Van Nuys. David Mendoza will be followed by Calvin Johnson. Good morning, Mr. Mendoza. Eh, buenos días eh, a todos los miembros. Eh, gracias por la oportunidad de estar aquí uh, frente a ustedes. Eh, y estamos eh, muy contentos, muy, entusias muy entusiastas sobre estos proyectos, sobre estos trabajos que están en proyecto, donde eh, no dudamos de la capacidad de ustedes, donde van a a apoyar con toda su capacidad y también un este por tu transducción. Okay. un momento okay. Okay, continúa por favor eh, donde estamos todos muy entusiastas sobre estos trabajos todas las familias eh, se van a beneficiar bastante gracias por todas estas oportunidades que nos dan yes. eh, esperamos que todos estos proyectos se lleven a cabo y muchas familias vamos a, a beneficiarnos tanto en lo económico, en lo salud, que ya que eh, la ciudad de Los Ángeles lo requiere muchísimo. Okay. Gracias y que Dios los bendiga. Gracias. Okay, I just wanted to say thank you very much for your time. I appreciate all the services. I know that all that you can do and if you pay attention to the need of the city, many families are going to be able to benefit because we need those services and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Calvin Johnson is our next speaker, then Pedro Alfaro, also in uh, Van Nuys. Good morning, Mr. Johnson. Good morning. I am from um, IBEW Local 11, and I'm for the football stadium that's going to be built, uh, proposed to be built at uh, Farmer Field. And I just wanted to know that every time a project comes up like this, it's like it gets through a lot of loops and hassles to get these things done. And to me, I think everybody will win-win if this football stadium is built. I mean, the city needs the revenues, people need jobs, unemployment is high, and we all should all support this to happen because the developers are there. So let's do this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Pedro Alfaro is our next speaker, then Michael Buchanan. Very nice. Good morning, morning uh, City Council. My name is Pedro Alfaro. I live in Bakersfield. Uh, we need these jobs here. Um, if you guys don't understand, um, I work for the Staples, LA Life, J. Maria, and uh, it gave me the opportunity to buy a house uh, to keep my son, uh, you know, in a good school and everything. And we need all this. If if we if we build this stadium, it would bring a lot more jobs, more tourism to this place. Um, like I said again, I mean I work at local 416 reinforcing, and um, that's what I got to say. Thank you. You guys have a good day. Thank you. You too. Thank you for uh, bringing your son as well. Michael Buchanan is our next speaker. After that is Victor Acuna. Good morning. All right. Good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Buchanan. I'm with Local 416 Ironworkers Los Angeles. I'm here today from Camero, California. Um, I'm here in support of the Farmers Field Stadium. Uh, been out of work for a while. Uh, jobs have been hit and miss. A job of this size is, is going to bring work for everybody. Not just iron workers, but electricians, carpenters, and after it, uh, you got to you got to keep it going. Um, let's see. I've had to I've had to leave the state of California just to go and find work, leaving my family, leaving leaving them, my children with family. I'm a single parent. It's a little hard to take to do that. Um, I'm getting ready to look at actually leaving again. Um, we call that booming out. But a job of this size, that, that'll keep me home around my children. Um, where they can say, you know, dad was there. Uh, there's, there's really not much more I can say. Thank you. Thank you. Hang in there. Uh, Victor Cunha is our next speaker. After that, uh, Lorraine Ornelas here. Good morning, sir. Good morning. My name is Victor Acuna. I live in Santa Clarita Valley. 
I'm a member of uh, Local 416 Reinforcements. Um, I need to ask you guys for, we're in favor, we're in favor of this uh, pride right here, because we need, we need you guys to support, we need that work. Uh, I've been, uh, I've been at work for five months, and uh, you just know how it is with, uh, it's hard to be without work, okay? Our family needs uh, a lot of things, and um, I've been here in Miss World for three years, for the past three years, and uh, we ask you guys to please support us on this right here, so all the trades can get uh, jobs, and uh, so we can get back in track, and uh, I just want to thank you guys for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for taking the time to testify today. Um, Lorraine Ornelas is here in Council Chambers, then we'll go back to Van Nuys for Miriam Fogler. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, Mr. President, members of the City Council. Lorraine Ornelas, 2731 Kirkhoff Avenue, San Pedro, Council District 15. I worked the last city election, which in my opinion cost this city an exorbitant amount of money. I graduated from Hoyoke High School in Massachusetts when I was 16 years old and worked in a paper mill as a cost clerk until I was old enough to enter nursing school, my chosen profession. I estimated cost of producing paper products. If we were not going to realize a profit, we did not produce the product. I am here to ask that you seriously consider having city elections vote by mail only to save money. You have no idea how much the last city election has cost you. I have been working on the city election board and the county since 1956 when I moved to San Pedro. In this past election, I worked in a county precinct where we had 21 voters from 7 o'clock in the morning until 8 o'clock at night. The salaries for four board members at that precinct was $415, which casts $22.14 per vote. Didn't count the 829 ballots that we had to return. My daughter worked in a city precinct where they had more items on the uh, uh, agenda, and they had six voters, six precinct workers, for a salary of $675, which decreased the cost to $8.35 per vote. This did not include the 1,020 ballots that were extra that had to be returned. Additional costs include printing of all sample ballots in the various languages. I didn't speak two minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Mitchell. Uh, in addition, we are each I'm sorry, ma'am. We have to try to keep it as fair as possible, the two-minute clock uh, for each person. But um, It was only it, one minute. We had it on I two minutes. It earlier. I'm sorry, ma'am. I swear to you it was two minutes. So, But if you want to give us the rest of your testimony, we can make sure it gets circulated. And the... Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. I'm sorry. We have to end the testimony there. But we, we did actually take this issue up just so you know. We've costed out both the uh, vote by mail only. So we'll see if we can get you a copy of that report, too, because it has uh, exactly those ideas you've talked about. Thank you. Uh, Miriam Fogler is our next speaker in Van Nuys. Then John Walsh will be next here in Council Chambers. Good morning, Ms. Fogler. And are we, uh, okay, we're on 16 or public comment? General public comment, ma'am. Okay, uh, you know, uh, we are in the, in the midst here of a great disaster, and we don't have leaders anywhere in the world. No one, not even Obama. He's, he's putting his head in the sand. You know, our city officials here are digging in to bankrupt the city. Folks? They're going for the whole thing. Like Jan Perry said, they're going to, the whole city council is going to go and make everybody redevelopment. Why don't we just rename the city of Los Angeles redevelopment? The city of redevelopment. Or a matter of fact, the state of California, for that matter. Because after all, that's the whole caboodle. And I couldn't get down here because I a problem with the throat. But 
you know, they, they, uh, cause the guy in, uh, in, in, in Barstow didn't want to vote against redevelopment. They have a big cloud here, folks. You think it's going to be good? Well, they're going to shut down the city, and you're not going to have any services, and the redevelopment will still are appointed, and they're a private agency, and they will tell you what to do. There won't be any more elections, because they're going to take away your rights. That's why they uh, put uh, item number 14 on, on hold, because they want to round up the guns, and they all gave themselves, the state of California, and the, the right to carry CCW permits, and I don't know if the local officials here, the city officials here can. As a matter of fact, you think that you're above God, you think you're more privileged, more rights than I am and other people on, in the city and county and state and the country that have a, have a right to carry a gun concealed. Not even more or less have it open. I think it's, to me, is a violation of everybody's right to protect themselves from violent people and violence. Thank you, That's Ms. taking Kruger. over, going on overseas. Thank you, and, and I know as our employees leave, just want to thank you again for being here. I know that you have a very important job to do. We will be addressing that later in this meeting, and so we look forward to addressing your concerns. Thank you very much for the work you do and for being here as well. Hold on one second, Mr. Walsh. Hold on one second, Ms. Mr. Walsh. Hold on. Mr. Walsh, if you'd like to address the council now, go ahead. I want Your time you to know now. it's a civil rights violation. File a federal complaint. If Spanish speakers are one minute losing one minute, that means it's against federal law. You file a federal complaint. These people aren't on your side. Mr. Garcetti, you should be on your side. Thank I'm you. talking. You know, you, I have to, what do I have to do? Get on my knees in front of you? I can't even talk to workers. You know, what I like about you people, politically correct fascists. And did you notice the complexion of these people? These people are minorities. And thank God for these minority workers. But you paint us. Thank you very much. Mr. Everybody should be very happy. Mr. Park should be very happy because community activist Damian Goodman needs a liver. He's dying. He needs a liver transplant. And I understand that Mr. Parks, when he heard that, said one less uppity black person in South Central to oppose me. And if he didn't say that, come like a man and tell me you didn't say that. I'm uh, Mr. Rosendahl. You got Zuma Dog, a, a white activist, a free uh, an apartment on the top of the list in Venice. What? But now a black activist is dying, and there's not one of you. And he's spoken in front of here on Fix Expo. Not one of you that give a damn. You want to see all the activists, black, white, brown, or yellow, dead. Go to redevelopment.com. Zev, your Hollywood Highlands .org. Hollywood Highlands .org. A new post will come up on Friday. Hollywood Highlands .org. Zev for mayor. Zev Yaroslavsky for mayor. Dual endorsement. Alex Padilla for mayor. And the rest of us. And you for anything but city uh, president of the city council. You're not going to get it. Hollywood Highlands .org. Richard Robinson is our next speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Walsh. Always a pleasure to see you. After Mr. Robinson will be Elizabeth Fold. I'm sorry, I can't quite read the last name, but um, Elizabeth will be after that. Go ahead, Mr. Robinson. Mr. President, members. Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me debt. Nathan Hale said, I might not agree with what you say, but I'll defend to the death your right to say it. Sir, we disagree constantly with what the public comes here throwing at you. It could be a lot worse. Pardon me, sir. Senator Feinstein, brilliantly, is defending gay marriage. Los Angeles Times, common knowledge. Daily News, Washington, D.C., U.S. to seek gay rights support at United Nations. Sanity is, sanity is coming to the issue of gay marriage. 
sir, my sister, in 1956, her lover committed suicide. This is the first time I mentioned that. This is the first time I talk about that. But it's a personal issue with me. Why I'm so vehemently against those who don't recognize that in defending marriage, it is the right of gay and lesbian lovers to marry which defends marriage. Thank you. Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Appreciate your comments. Uh, is there an Elizabeth that wanted to speak? And my apologies for not quite your last name, if you'll just uh, stay for the record. Full name. Good morning. Uh, for the record, my name is Elizabeth Saldivar. Saldivar, thank you. And I'm here to address the City Council um, for a very important concern. Um, I would like to request uh, uh, the City Controller to uh, make an audit and to open an investigation of a possible conflict of interest with Ms. Uh, Beatrice. Uh, Olvera Stotzer, who is the uh, City of Los Angeles uh, Housing Authority um, Commissioner Chair, and she is also the um, uh, executive uh, chief executive of New Capital Property Management, which manages my units. Uh, El Corazon Apartments is a city subsidized uh, hood home project. It receives California hood uh, tax allocation credit um, subsidies and it's a building for low income housing. Um, this management company uh, has uh, been and it's in non-compliance with the regulatory agreement with the loans and uh, what is required from Los Angeles Housing Department. Um, we have many uh, people who are concerned. Uh, there, have been, there has been uh, four discrimination cases filed from my units, uh, 14 families from Tierra del Sol. And uh, please look at the news uh, where she has been uh, misusing um, public funding and the three million that were uh, stolen by New Academy, uh, which is in the LA Times. This is serious and it needs to be looked at and um, I would like to speak to someone to address this concern. It is public monies and it, she is a public official but she's also a private business owner and um, I believe there is double dipping is a new term for me and um, thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you very much for your testimony. We appreciate it very much. Um, Candido Mares is our next speaker. Noel Weiss will follow after Mr. Mares. And we will go to San Pedro. Good morning, Good morning. Mr. President, Council Members. Public safety is number one, and I am here today to speak strongly in support of the LAPD, uh, the LA Fire Department, and especially to the C Criminal Division of the City Attorney's Office, where their uh, numbers have been reduced from 117 million down to about approximately 73 million. We are in a crisis, and we are about to experience it in the next two years. I. I truly believe that within the next two years we will have an earthquake here in City Hall, and I'm not talking about a financial earthquake, I'm talking about the real one, will happen, and we will need every available person when it comes to public safety. And to those 911 operators, thank you, because you truly are the guardian angels of this city of angels, and so I hope that you will work hard to make sure that we keep the uh, public safety of this city intact. I know you can do it. The leadership's there. Mr. Garcetti, I know you have the leadership with this city council to help keep jobs and to make sure that this city stays safe. So um, I hope that you'll work towards those goals. And there are a lot of things that we can do to cut uh, costs without uh, cutting people. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. We'll be addressing some of those uh, shortly on the financial status report. Noel Weiss is our next speaker. After that, we'll go to San Pedro and Charles Leon. Um, council members, good, good morning. morning. I owe Mr. Gregorian again a thank you. I got uh, used up my two minutes uh, with regard to the CRA issues. Um, and it's not often that 
one council member essentially calls out another, but I think, and, and Mr. Weston was most gracious in his response, that essentially uh, uh, he didn't have enough time to negotiate this, and that's why the council did not have sufficient time to evaluate it. But going forward, hopefully that's not just procedural, but substantive. And, and, and on this, uh, and again, I appreciate Mr. Gregorian's uh, 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 having done that, shall we say. Um, with regard to the NFL stadium issue, um, sounds like uh, Mr. Delvac and his group are setting us all up for a statement of overriding considerations. Environmental is not going to work, but notwithstanding, we have to build the stadium anyway due to due to these economic uh, issues. I want to, again, propose an idea, what I call the 100,000 10K solution, empowering the people economically. Green Bay Packers are owned by the people of Green Bay. 100,000 people, 10,000 a person in a city of 4 million, that's a billion dollars. Okay? And I think Mr. Lewicki could be very, very, not just forthcoming, but incredibly progressive if, he involve, if, if AEG involves the people in this endeavor. And it, by the way, it would be equity, not debt. And that would make it more cost effective going forward uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, providing something to the, to, uh, the people. Um, finally, in, I want to suggest on a more positive note, rather than have Mr. Kikorian or others call you each other out, I want to have a situation where we have every Friday, since the place is packed, we have a situation where we've got one council member basically giving a state of the council speech. And like in British Parliament, for another 10 or 15 minutes after that, you guys can question each other. And you know what? In terms of theater, in terms of substance and style, it would be very effective because it's very important symbolically for the people to see that the city council Council deliberates, and it's not just 15 to nothing, and there's some thought going by what you're doing. That's my suggestion. Maybe it'll happen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weiss. Uh, we'll next go to San Pedro, and Charles Leone will be our next speaker. Come back here for Arnold Sachs and Chambers. Good morning, sir. Council President Garcetti, thank you so much for your time. I'm calling from San Pedro and uh, your honorable body. If only they knew the number of potholes from the drive from downtown Los Angeles to San Pedro. I'm representing the working men and women of street services. Yeah, you and your leadership with uh, Weezer back in January uh, called to study classifications for exemption of furloughs in street services. Sir, I'm speaking before you today because there is the ability to take street services and all of their field staff off of furloughs. You've been told about a 90% reimbursable rate. You've been told about impacts to the general fund. And I'm telling you right now, the scare tactics that are being used, that if we were to take street services off of furloughs, that somehow it's going to uh, have to have us do an extra furlough for other workers in the city, is absolute hogwash. We're counting on your leadership. They call it the Acting Bureau of Street Services because they, have, they don't even have the number of people to do the job that they need to do. And furloughs have made things worse. Of all the bureaus in the Department of Public Works, nobody has given back more to the City of Los Angeles than the Bureau of Street Services. So we're counting on your leadership. Today, you have the ability to take all field staff in the Bureau of Street Services off of furloughs. They have surplus gas tax dollars, gas tax money residents pay for. Trees are falling. There's potholes. The resurfacing models aren't going to get complete. These are needs and services our constituents want. Constituents here in San Pedro, constituents in Hollywood, constituents in Eagle Rock, constituents in South L.A. We have the ability to take the remaining field staff, all field staff in street services, off of furloughs. Please, sir, the impact of the general fund is just not there. We have the surplus gas tax dollars. Don't buy into the scare tactics. Return vital services to a full work schedule. That's what you called for in January. It still hasn't gotten done. We need your leadership. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, and thank you for your tireless work on this as well, Charles. Um, we will next hear from Arnold Sachs as he's coming up. Mr. LeBons for an introduction. Uh, right now I have a special introduction to some great young people from Nimitz Middle School from the city of Huntington Park. Stand and be recognized by the city council. Welcome to Los Angeles City Hall. I think there's the future right there. There's the guy. What's that guy's name right there? He's very good. He's not scared of anything. Good job. Welcome, Nimitz. Thank you very much, and welcome to City Hall. Mr. Sachs, our next speaker, then we'll hear from Walter Bechtel. Yes, thank you. Good morning again, Arnold Sachs. Please, Mr. President, when you discussed the uh, outline of the council meetings, you mentioned be cognizant of people's time. You should be shouldn't have to say that. Again, we run this show. This is like Groundhog Day. Every year, with your budget deficit, it's a matter of the time. 
you have a 400 million budget deficit this year, show up, show your constituents you're ready to go to work at 10 o'clock. If you can't do that, then how do we know that you can do other work? I'd like to make some comments about some things people said. The woman who talked about consolidating uh, the elections. Consider consolidating the elections to one day. I mean, you have alternating, day, alternating years for your council seats, but consolidation with maybe the school board, with maybe the state elections. The manuals that are handed out by the county, is anybody considered a re, uh, getting, getting those back, giving the election workers fees to save those? Another bit of information, yesterday's newspaper mentioned that the housing director was fired, released from his job. He went on to say that A, he's getting $440,000 a year plus 10 weeks paid vacation, which comes out to about another $82,000 a year. Please, and Mr. President, you clarified about information, please clarify what the hell somebody does to earn $520,000 in the city of LA? What do you, how do these people get compensated? Who do they know? Mr. Mr. Um, Yaroslavsky for mayor? He couldn't replace Mayor McFry. Thank you, Thank you sir. Walter Bechtel is our next speaker. Uh, okay, uh, I just want to add something a little bit more to what I said yesterday about the football stadium. Uh, I'd like to reiterate, I don't think it's a good idea for a football stadium to be put downtown L.A. It's already overcrowded here. we got problems with the movie people, and we've got plenty down there already at the, uh, the uh, Staples Center. Uh, if you put the football stadium in here, all that construction is great and find all these people employed, but all the businesses are going to suffer just like they did up and down Wilshire when you put in the, the subway. I, I think that, like again, I said before, I don't think you shouldn't put it in the city, you should put it up towards Lancaster or something like that. People out towards Lancaster and Palmdale are more football kind of people. I, I was born out there in Lancaster. I know those are the, that kind of people out there. And I don't see how that's going to hurt the, the construction industry. Those people are still going to have jobs, and it's going to benefit the county of Los Angeles uh, without the, the problem of the overcrowding. And I think a couple of people come on the radio and other places have said it's, it's really going to hurt more than it's going to help if you put an extra amount of something in the downtown area. You say you're moving forward. Well, if, if you're moving forward, you got to understand that you, you keep putting too many people in one place. That's the mentality of people when we only had a few thousand people in the city of Los Angeles. Now we have several million people. If you're going to move forward, you got to move out to the places where the people are going to be. And it's going to move out towards Lancaster and that area, and it's going to fill the whole area of the county of Los Angeles. I think it's more intelligent to move out there. And uh, I don't see where it wouldn't benefit the city of L.A. anyway, because if the construction is being done with, with the same people, it's still going to employ them. Thank you. Thank you very much. That will uh, close our general public comment. Uh, we'll now turn to co public comment on items called special. We'll start with number one, Mr. Sachs, if you'd like to come forward, and John Walsh will follow on item number one. Thank you again, Arnold Sachs. We want to adopt an ordinance authorizing and ordering the removal of weeds, rubbish, refuge, and dirt upon certain streets, sidewalks, parkways, or in front of certain private properties in the city of L.A. So, uh, you've had items on your agenda recently regarding the CRA, and they're being paid or they're, they're creating contracts to make improvements to sidewalks. Then again, what happens if the property is in a CRA area? Project zone. Um, who pays for that? 
Who's going to pay for the workers? You just heard from somebody from Bureau of Street Services that is going to that cl claims that you don't have you budget deficit furloughs. So where are you going to get the workers? You're going to outsource this work now? You're going to charge the homeowner, the business owner? What happens? The sidewalks to be prepared. You can't get redevelopment funds in to redevelopment areas, but you can get redevelopment funds for redevelopment project areas. And it, again, the language being project is going up, being funded through redevelopment, then the area around it is also included. But in areas of low income where redevelopment is established to to help the property owners, they can't get labeled as redevelopment project areas because it keeps the property values down. If you raise the property values, then everybody else would be able to step up. Just take example, the sale in Hollywood versus the sale of property in South Central. $800,000 versus $4 million. It's a joke. Thank you, sir. John Walsh will be our next speaker, and Mr. Sachs will have your comments on item 15 after that. I'm leaving after this uh, this agenda item. If you, if you, uh, if there was some uh, staff people. Uh, I don't need to filibuster you. I get 1.2 million successful server requests in the past 12 months. Uh, this concerns weed abatement. Go to Hollywood Highlands, H-I-G-H-L-A-N-D-S dot org, or go to Hollywood Dems, Hollywood and D-E-M-S at gmail dot com to give us information. Uh, and also Twitter us at Mickey Jackson or Facebook and friend, become a friend of Mickey Jackson and myself at M-I-K-I-J Jackson. Yeah, the weeds are growing. The weeds are overgrown. And maybe that's where you can hide the bodies of the people who have heart attacks because they only spoke Spanish and spent an extra two minutes on the line before the ambulance came. You can hide them in the weeds. HollywoodHighlands.org. Vence Ramos. All righty. Uh, we have item um, 15, Mr. Sachs and Mr. Walsh. Uh, I think Mr. Walsh has passed um, on item 15. Thank you again, you are. Arnold Sachs. Again, this is a case that arises out of the city's construction of curb ramps. So, again, I mentioned in previous council actions during the past couple of weeks, you had CRA going to make improvements in sidewalks, in roadways. Would that include creating uh, construction of street ramps. The point being here, the CRA is in a city agency, is in a city department. It's not, it's not inherent to follow the city budgetary processes. So if the CRA builds something like this or doesn't build something for uh, a curb ramp, why would the city then be liable? And we go back again to last year during the budget discussions in Councilman Park saying the city can't afford to fix sidewalks. But the CRA can afford to fix sidewalks. So it's, a, it's like a, a high speed game of ping pong. And the public is the ball. And if you've ever watched that on TV, they smashed the crap out of that ball. How much is this settlement going to cost us? How, oh no, excuse me. How much is this settlement going to cost the city public? Because I'm not living in the city, but I do come down here just to ask some questions. Thank you again for your time. Answers. And a thank you. We will close our public comment uh, hey. on this one. And uh, with that, we'll go ahead and we can take up items one and six. Sorry, we're going to take 15 up in closed session one. If we can take a vote on that, please prepare the roll and tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. That is approved. That will take us to item number six. And I'd like to recognize our budget and finance chairman, Mr. Parks, and our Thank CAO. You.
as well. Mr. President, could we have uh, the CAO and the CLA at the table, please? Colleagues, while they're coming up, uh, I think, first of all, uh, and uh, from the Budget and Finance Committee of perception, is that uh, the third financial status report or the mid-year report uh, is probably some of the finest work by the city CAO in being able to find $50 million, as they said, looking in the, uh, under the uh, couches, uh, looking under pillows of chairs. And the things that I think is important as they go through their presentation for you to identify, they were able to maintain $191 million in our reserve fund, which is particularly important as we move forward for next year and talk about trans and how much money that we may have to spend in that regard and how much interest we may have to pay. They also were able to close this gap down to $4 million by not adding one more furlough day to a city employee. The key on this issue, not saying we could make that promise for next fiscal year, but for this report at mid-year, they were able to find $50 million, reduce the deficit to $4 million without giving one more furlough day. So that's a remarkable set of circumstances. Uh, they have also created a document that we'll be dealing with in budget and finance in the near future that talks about at least 50 recommendations of either merging departments, reorganizing the city, re reworking how the city should perform its duties. And this is something that will be coming to the council down the road. But I think as we move forward, just as we heard today from the presentation of PSRs, every department has a statement that if they were given more money, they could be more effective. Every department believes that they were given more money, they would be able to do more for the community. This proposal today allows everybody to have somewhat equal pain. And the issue is if we go through it and start moving pieces of it, it will pop out somewhere else. So by moving dollars to one department, you're taking dollars from another department. By eliminating furloughs, the additional furloughs for everyone. If you move money there, it could cause a furlough to occur. So these are things I think we have to think about. And by no means am I telling you this is a perfect report, but I think when you go through it, you'll see it basically has addressed the direction we've given them. Uh, we thought that it was not appropriate to add five more furlough days to employees in the middle of the fiscal year. Uh, we also thought that it was important that we not lose sight of the importance of the reserve fund and we shouldn't take the reserve fund lightly because everyone from our uh, bond people to those who monitor what we do are watching how stringent we are as relates to dealing with this. And even with the $191 million, it's still $28 million short of our goal of a 5% reserve fund. But it gives us something to keep building on and it's something that we should not look at it as just a pot of money to move forward. And so let me ask Miguel to move forward in giving an overview. We certainly do not need to go through the detail we went in committee, but certainly I think it's important to give the overview, the four-year projection, uh, the reserve fund issues and the things that are relevant and also tie it into the discussion that we had about what's coming on the uh, 50 pro uh, proposals that you put together and how it ties into next year's budget to secure some decisions made today to ensure that we get a full year recovery next year. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilman uh, Miguel Santana, CAO. Um, good morning. Um, why don't we start off with simply looking at this fiscal year first, uh, and then we'll talk briefly regarding the, the three-year plan that we updated from last year. So I'll be working off the document that's uh, the subject line reads, third financial status report. Um, there were three documents that were submitted on Friday. Um, um, if you could look specifically on page number four of that document, it shows a pie chart. John. It shows a pie chart that basically shows how we resolve the remainder of this year's deficit uh, as a result in not moving forward on the P3. 
Um, the, the revised target that we now have is $42.7 million. It went down because we were able to make some changes in our revenue assumptions, uh, particularly when it relates to ambulance billing. There was uh, concern at the time that when we switched over to a private vendor that the state was not acknowledging that vendor in terms of reimbursements. They have now acknowledged that new vendor and we will be fully reimbursed for those uh, for that work so that's on target and a number of other revisions in terms of revenue and deficits that have been closed within departments so the problem we're trying to solve for today is 42.7 million dollars and as uh, the councilman indicated uh, we were given the direction by the budget and finance committee to do so without no additional furlough days and without any additional layoffs and so what I instructed my staff to do is to literally go through every single account that we have as a city and determine whether it's on target if we evaluate our revenue assumptions in a variety of areas and as a result we were able to to close the majority of those accounts. Normally we do this at the end of the fiscal year, um, where we're doing it in advance. So to summarize, uh, those include a revision and looking at capital projects that have been closed, whatever surplus exists that were budge was budgeted for those projects. Normally those savings would go back to buy down the debt that was issued or go back to the reserve fund. We're recommending in the $8 million be targeted for, to close out this year. There is a surplus of $3 million of SPRF funds that we're recommending be brought back, an additional million that was set aside for the completion of the P3 project. Then because we're now moving forward, we can now add that, which is $4 million. A, a revision of, of our a savings in our health uh, account, and those savings come as a result of the 5% premium that EAA employees are contributing to this year as a result of that. Uh, a seven million in increase in gas tax funding um, that allows us then to take out of the, the general a portion of the general fund subsidy that goes into street services um, and use that money. Um, and UB uh, and taking out 13 million that we believe is not necessary out of the UB. Uh, there are two pieces in here that do result in a change in services or, or targeted um, areas. One is we are recommending not moving forward on the remaining class uh, in, in, the, in the police workforce. Uh, we are recommending because the voters have approved a, a new pension system that becomes effective July 1st that we delay in that final class um, and hire the, and make their official hiring date be after that new pension system kicks in. Uh, that provides a, a small amount of savings this year, about 700000 but in the, in the lifetime of that employee, because they will now be under the new pension system, it will provide us a $7 million savings uh, in the pension system. And we are recommending um, a, a, a small reduction in the Department of Rec and Parks of $2.8 million. Um, that was an additional funding that was provided by your, by your council uh, beyond what is mandated through the charter. Uh, so in total, uh, it closes the majority of the gap. Uh, there is a $4.1 million um, to be determined area, and we will be able to hopefully, through the, between now and the end of the fiscal year, find additional solutions to close that gap. Um, what this does, it preserves the reserve fund. The reserve fund is a critical part of our financing. It's, it's what rating agencies look at to determine our fiscal health. Um, and our, our, while we have a strong, a solid rating, uh, credit rating, we need to maintain that as we borrow money out with our trans uh, early next fiscal year. Uh, so it bring, leaves a reserve fund at $191 million. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. This is ready to go if you want right. to do this. Okay. Are you going to go through the... Sure. Would you like me to do the three-year plan now? Okay. Yeah. 
So, so, so there's two. There's really one action that we're asking you to uh, consider for today, and that is related to closing out the deficit for this fiscal year. There was an additional document that we submitted that provided a three-year outlook for the future and made uh, a half a billion dollars worth of recommendations and options to all of you to consider to address the deficits that we know will be coming next year and the following year and the year after that. And so to, we won't, I do not recommend going through all of the different proposals in there. Uh, we will be working with the Chairman of Budget and Finance and the Chairman of your respective committees to discuss the individual items. But what we're doing briefly today is just giving you a brief overview um, of, of what we're recommending. I'll do that now. We put a PowerPoint together to do that. The first slide simply uh, shows, if you could go to the next slide, it's, it really reminds us all that we've been on a, uh, making progress in reducing uh, over two, uh, $1 billion in the last two years. Uh, we, we often don't get credit for the fact that we've made so, much, so many reductions throughout our system and utilize a number of one-time solutions but also ongoing solutions to, to achieve that. If you go to the next slide, it gives you an indication of how our budget has changed in the last 10 years. Um, the, the budget has grown uh, and reached its peak in 2008 and has been on a, has, has slowly started reducing um, and will continue on that trajectory. The third slide really gives you a, a real sense of how much we've reduced the workforce in a very short period of time. The workforce that we have today, um, particularly in the civilian side, is, is sm the smallest workforce we've had in 10 years. So Mayor Reardon had, in his last terms, had a larger workforce than the one that you're currently governing over. And so, um, it's important to show, particularly for folks who who may criticize us of not engaging in uh, in ongoing reductions, that in a period of two years, the workforce has been cut by 4,000 employees. That's an unprecedented reduction in a very short period of time. And when you contrast that number with only 500 layoffs, we've done this in a way to avoid the impact not only to the economy, because we know layoffs, um, we already have a very high unemployment rate in Los Angeles, but we've also done it in a way to minimize the impact on our workforce. The next slide gives, reminds us all of all the solutions that were adopted in your budget, and if you go through them, not all of them had came to fruition, or throughout the year we've been making adjustments to ensure that we close the year in the black with the healthy reserve fund. And one of the the things that we we get recognized in Wall Street is the fact that on a quarterly basis we open up the budget, adjust it to reflect drops in revenue or increases in expenditures to ensure that we remain balanced throughout the course of the year. So this is how we started and of course if we were to revise that, that would change. We wouldn't have the one-time um, uh, parking revenue, parking facilities uh, element in there as an example. So the following chart five shows you where we are today. And basically, I just summarize all the different pieces that we're recommending you approve to ensure that we end the year uh, not only in the black, but also with a solid reserve fund of, of $190 million. The slide six shows you how the reserve fund has fluctuated. And, um, we, we've been, we, it's, the voters approved requiring the city to have a 2.75 reserve fund for emergency purposes. This calculates in that, that requirement and then allows for an additional element so that we have enough room for cash flow, for um, changes in our revenue and, and expenditures. The, the city council's policy is that we establish a 5%, and as Mr. Parks indicated, we're about $30 million away from reaching that goal. 
the, the 5% is seen as the floor, not the ceiling. And uh, to be in a strong financial shape, the goal should be to exceed that uh, in the future. As a result of these actions, we did experience two downgrades in, if you recall, last year. But if you look in context, as, as we compare to other major cities, we fall somewhere in the middle in terms of our credit rating. Um, the dangerous thing about where we're at today is that one more downgrade would make it, uh, prohibits us from accessing certain elements of the market uh, that is a big part of purchasing our debt. And so maintaining our credit re record is an important part of uh, ensuring that when we go out to the market for borrowing that we do so in the, at the lowest credit rate. And of course all of us have read about all the discussion that's happening on a national level regarding the state of the municipal bond market. Um, some of it we believe is inflated and, and doesn't really reflect the reality that that uh, most cities have engaged in. There, the number of defaults throughout history are very, very minimal. But there is a level of anxiety that is out there, particularly among um, you know your average citizen who are really the core of those who purchase our bonds. So maintaining this credit that rating is critical. Unfortunately, the future, while we've been maintained a balanced budget uh, during very difficult times and during the, one of the biggest recessions since the Great Recession, we still continue to face deficits in the future. Uh, you've heard it uh, mentioned the $350 million deficit next fiscal year. Uh, this later to FSR reports that because we are seeing some decline in revenue, we already know that the um, transfer for next year is likely to be less than it is now. We're seeing a slight dip in some of the other revenue uh, that that when the mayor's budget comes out, that deficit could go up anywhere between 30 to 50 million dollars more. And we'll know, have more information in the next few weeks when we get the sales tax receipts from the Christmas holiday, as well as the latest property tax figures. So the question is, what's driving this deficit? If we've reduced the size of the workforce significantly, um, while we've seen revenues drop, it hasn't been, if you compare it to the last chart, the earlier chart that showed sort of the, the, the drop in our revenue, why are we still facing these deficits? And the answer is simply that the cost of maintaining business, the cost of our people, is growing at a much faster rate than, than revenue. And so there are, there are several elements to that. The first thing is simply the wages that we pay our employees. And we've all, uh, we, t we had a long discussion last year about COLAs that kicked in as a result of moving forward with furloughs and layoffs. But this is just to give you an example of what the future lies as it relates to agreed um, uh, COLAs to 60% of the civilian workforce. In total, our deficit for next, for next year is projected to be, as I indicated, 350. Almost 30% of it comes from employee compensation adjustments. 14% of it comes from civilian pensions. 30% of it comes from fire and police pensions, of which a, a, por a portion of it increased just in the last six weeks due to two changes. One, in the assumption of um, the rate of return that the fire and police pensions has, and the second is the assumption on the growth of health care costs for retirees. 3% increase in workers' comp, 7% in health, and then 14% is that at the voters have uh, supported bond measures to build new, for, new facilities. We have to budget for the operational um, costs of those different facilities. This is what, just in relation to the cost of our workforce, how they contribute to the future deficits, and this is, shows the incremental increases. And you know, the red represents health, the blue represents uh, fire police pensions and civilian pensions. On pensions alone, we, you know, several months ago we did a Pensions 101 workshop. Uh, this uh, reminds us that we're going to reach a uh, $1.2 billion uh, pension cost starting the year 1516, which will represent about a third of the general fund at that time. 
In healthcare, and, uh, we've seen a 10% increase in healthcare costs in the last uh, 10, uh, every year for the last 10 years, 113% overall if you look at, uh, the, uh, just a look back in the last 10 years. Um, and so any efforts we make to actually reduce that uh, adds, brings us, uh, helps us reduce the projected deficit. The action that we did this year with working with labor to increase co-pays to have for the first time one bargaining unit actually contribute towards a premium uh, of health care costs. All of that helps in mitigating and we're already starting to see some of that benefit for the next uh, health care year which starts January 1. So the meat of our report really talks about what we recommend we start exploring to get out of this crisis so that we're not constantly in the state of crisis year after year after year. So we actually start reaching some level of normal uh, that's, that is different from where we are today. And every city, every county, every school district, every state in the, in the country is going through this exact same process. Uh, we mentioned a report what's going on in Chicago and in Costa Mesa and other parts of the country to remind us that we're not alone in this. And one of the things that you've done as a council is that you took action early, two years ago, by not engaging in, the, in easy ways out, you know, issuing pension obligation bonds or selling off your meters. You actually began this process of reducing the size of the workforce and dealing with these issues. And so we recommend building upon those, that success. So there are four main strategies that we recommend. The first one is responsible management of fiscal practices, and that simply means health, maintaining a healthy reserve fund, committing to that 5%, and actually adopting a policy that every um, for every dollar that we get of one-time revenue, we park half of it towards a reserve fund until we reach that goal. That we find ways to maximize funding uh, and provide flexibility in the funding that we have. We self-impose through ordinances ways to chop up our, ge our, our general fund dollars and that makes the general fund available less and less. And so what we're recommending is that we engage in the process to review all the ways that we do that and ask ourselves, is this how we would prioritize our funding? Should should, should we have that funding available? And it may be that that's in fact how we would do it. it our priorities would reflect how we separate out money for the arts or separate out for, for parking or separate out for infrastructure. But it, we're at a point where we need to revisit our assumptions and ask ourselves that question. We recommend consolidating some administrative functions, particularly in human resources and other areas, and strengthening our ways that we manage our, our, our assets. And then part of all of this is even if you were to adopt every single recommendation in here, the reality is is that we will continue to face a shortfall in the outer years. So ultimately what is needed is a new revenue source. And so we're asking that you direct the CLA and the CAO's office to come back to you with ways to do so. The second piece is, is, is looking at core services. And of course the way every member of this board, of this, uh, this council defines core services differently. We are recommending you engage in a very deliberative process of discussing what those core services are and find ways to reevaluate discretional programs, consolidate services, and, and for those things that only we know we, could, we have to do, find ways to evaluate how we're doing them, come up with efficiencies and redesign them to make them more cost effective. The third area is we, we, we were recommending that we look at opportunities to engage in alternative service delivery models. One, in some cases, other people do things better than we do, and we should find opportunities to partner with them to provide better services. In other ways, we could, we could uh, leverage our contributions with a nonprofit or with a private foundation and actually have the private sector engage to a greater extent to provide a level of service that currently we're providing. 
The third area is to strengthen our core functions. And so IT is a good example of that, where perhaps we should look at how we could transition our program to a private sector model, because they have the capacity to adapt to changes in technology and bring in latest innovations in a way that perhaps we're limited in. And then the final piece is looking at our workforce itself, looking at those principal drivers that are that were, we demonstrated are what's creating the deficits in the first place. So, so this process includes the continual reduction of the workforce and bringing it to a sustainable level, setting targets for savings in healthcare and workers' comp, finding ways to control our pension and retiree health care benefits, and we provide two very specific examples of that. Uh, find within the next 10 years, realigning our compensation structure so that we're in a range where there isn't so many distortions that exist. And finally, and most importantly, I think, is finding ways to eliminate furloughs uh, through the concessions that we negotiate. Otherwise, as the final chart shows, we will be in a situation like we are this year where the only way we close our budget is through furloughs. And so if, we, if, it's in our, if it's our intention to not have furloughs be part of the reality of the city for the next five years, we have to find a ways to negotiate them and work with our partners in labor to do so. So um, we'll be working with the Budget and Finance Committee and all of you in discussing the various elements of, of what is being proposed. Uh, and of course, the mayor's budget, which gets released in a month from now, will provide you the, the the, the very specific opportunity to first uh, understand how the mayor um, uh, responded to the recommendations we made and also give you a set of tools to then either to support or to come up with an alternative when the budget is being discussed a month from now. Thank you. Colleagues, I think what's important on page 14 is that these are principles that we'll eventually bring to you to, to basically vote on as principles for the future of our budget so that we can say these are the things we're asking the CLA, CAO to work on as everything that goes through that uh, sifter for the budget has to meet these principles so that we have a sense of what we're going forward on. The other thing is that uh, we've had a brief discussion uh, on the issue of core responsibilities where everybody in this room has a different view of what a core responsibility is. And we've asked the CAO and the CLA to meet and begin to discuss whether the charter gives us good guidance as it relates to core because so many of our functions are in the charter as relates to some are uh, by ordinance. And so this is another part of the equation that we can then agree on what our core responsibilities are. So these are the things that we will be bringing to you. We'll be having uh, additional meetings in budget and finance to talk about these principles, but also we hope to be bringing you some ideas that should be part of next year's budget and get it approved early on so that we can get a full year of savings on those things that have a, a, a savings uh, uh, aspect to it or a more efficient way to run the city by bringing functions together that are of like uh, activities are not in conflict. So page, 20, page 14 is a very important group of principles just as we started several years ago dealing with our budget policies it gives the guidance to say this is the direction that we're going in and in, under those four principles uh, there are a number of pieces uh, that deal with it that will get far more discussion as we bring them before council. Uh, Miguel, uh, also, could we just give a brief overview of most of our departments have curtailed their spending and there's a handful that there has been adjustments made as relates to uh, uh, addressing the overages at this time. And also I think it's be important that although Ms. Gould uh, is not here, if you could articulate what came out of committee about what her intentions are about how she will balance the budgets in the future as opposed to the routine moving money out of reserve fund into balancing department's budgets. Her intent now is to do, uh, require a council action so that general managers are more accountable for going over budget. So we comment on that. Uh, certainly. If you if you going back to the third financial status report um, on page 22, 
it enumerates sort of a snapshot of how some of the larger departments are doing as it relates to their own budgets. Of course, the, the pie chart that we show where we uh, virtually re re eliminate the deficit for this year is contingent on all departments meeting their budget targets. And so in this chart, we show where the departments are as a relation to their budgets. And um, we see that the city attorney, the fire department, and the police department still have some deficits uh, that remain. Um, we are confident that each one of those departments will, will close on target. Um, but one of the things that the controller has stated um, is that she intends to inform us uh, early enough in the process if in fact it looks like a department will not end in the black by the end of the fiscal year. In which case, what normally happens is that if a department still ends the year with a deficit, the reserve fund is used to mitigate that shortfall. And that happens automatically. What has, she has now indicated is that she will inform your counsel well in advance if a department is not on track and the only way she will actually appropriate any reserve fund dollars to make that department whole is through your action. And so that is a change in how we manage um, the budget and it's, it's a way of protecting the reserve fund and also encouraging departments to maintain a balanced budget uh, this fiscal year. Mr. Zine. Thank you, Mr. President. The, um, the LAPD, you mentioned the LAPD over budget and the hiring after July 1st. Um, I understand a class recently started. Where are we at? If you look at the LAPD numbers, including the folks in the police academy at different phases of the academy. We can certainly have a police department response specifically, but it's my understanding that um, right now with the new class that was just hired, um, that there are 9,949 9, 9, police officers uh, and, and there is discussion about an additional class later this year. But, uh, it, so 9,949. Well, I would, I would rely on the police department's latest figures I was given to this yesterday. We, we made this commitment of 9963, and we want to hold true to that commitment. Uh, also, with the voters passing the pension modification, it would obviously be better to, if we send a letter out for hiring, your start date would be July 1st or after July 1st. But if we add up all the personnel that we have on the streets, detectives, administrative, in the academy, different phase of the academy, sick, IOD, long term, if we add everybody up, Sworn personnel, what's our number today? Jerry Chandler, for Los Angeles Police Department. As of today, we're at 9904. 9904. 9 As of Monday, we will be at 9949, because that's when the 45 people start in the academy. We, we expect to lose between now and July 1st another 49 or 50, which means actually probably more, more like 52 or 53. Um, we expect to be down somewhere near 98, 90 by the end, before July 1st. So if Into we look at the ones on drop, if we look at the ones that are obviously need to retire because of drop, uh, and I look at the blue line with retirements, which have really slowed down. They used to have multiple pages, right. and they've really, really slowed down. This anticipation of the numbers versus those that have actually put in their papers or they're coming up to that drop date where the drop five year ends. Are we realistically at 9,950, would you say, or somewhere in that ballpark or down lower than that? 9,950 when? Pardon me? When? As of Monday? Well, as well, this is the end of March. We got April, right. May, we got three months. Right. If we could slide for three months and get people situated and let them know their start date is after July 1st. See, it wouldn't bother me to say we're going to hold off with the academy class yet send the letters out for hiring. But it seems if you slide under that wire and you're going to get in the old pension system, which obviously the voters, you know, they supported the change, you know, we're talking three months. Is it a critical mass that we have or can we slide for this particular time but still go ahead with recruitment Let's say your start date. 
is July 1st or after. The instructions, well, first of all, let me tell you what our position would be, but what our instructions were. Obviously, in a perfect world, we'd like to hire to attrition as quickly as we can. The chief of police has stated that to maintain the level of service we have, 9963 is the minimum number. That that allows him, through the uh, efficient use of deployment as he has, to put the appropriate number in patrol and still have the appropriate number of special units that we have that's helping to reduce crime on an ongoing basis. In the, so to get to 9963, we would have to hire another class, certainly at least one class between now after the class that starts on the 28th of March, we'd have to hire another class before July 1st. In the discussions on Monday in the Budget and Finance Committee, the Budget and Finance Committee expressed a view that we should wait till July 1st to hire the last class because that would save the city money under the new pension system which certainly we can do. We will not be at 9963 at the end of the year if we do that because we expect to be somewhere at 9890 or something by the end of, by June 30th and you don't want to hire a class of 70 people. It would mean that we'd have to take, it would take us two or three months in next year to get up to 9963 again by hiring every month. What it will do by waiting till July 1st to hire is push more hiring in the front of the year than we would normally want to do, but we'll do it to get back up to 9963. Every month we wait, we lose people. The number I gave you of 49 is what we expect based on our uh, personnel department's view of attrition, and we've been pretty right on within a few, is that we expect to lose 49 more people after March 28th. That would get us down. Well, no, normally, they would wait until July 1st because there's a COLA, if there is a COLA, um, that kicks in the July 1st. That's why the number is so low. It's only about 15 a month. Right. So some of those are dropped. And they're, they're holding are back, waiting for July 1st. So if we would wait, and then July 1st or after, uh, the other question is, under the Reardon administration, they talked about 10,000 officers, and they said, well, we really don't have 10,000, but equivalent to where they gave overtime, cash right. overtime. Could there be a possibility where to maintain that 9963, there was some cash overtime that could help soften that? So you would actually maintain that? Are you smiling? So you already I'm smiling because we don't have any money for cash overtime. We haven't been given. Well, I'm, I'm talking about if we want to hold true to the 9963, it's either the bodies or equivalent well, to because if they're working overtime, then they're out there. Here's working. where we are now. Because of the agreement made on compensatory, compensatory overtime, at uh, 400 hours, allowing officers to have a bank of 400 hours, and with the requirement that at 250 hours or the right of 250 hours to make people take time off to keep right. the bank low, because that bank somebody's going to have to pay at some point in the future. Exactly. Um, we lose the equivalent of about 400 deployable officers a month. So I and and I don't think, and I know the protector league probably disagrees with this, but but I don't believe that we have we could. We would have enough cash to generate enough overtime to do what you're suggesting. To balance that out. Yes. Okay, I'll come back with some more. Thank you. Okay. Thank I'll you, be, Mr. I'll be here. <laughs> Mr. Labonge is our next speaker. Uh, just, uh, Mr. Santana, thank you. On the issue uh, in your report where you talked about, I don't see re-engineering as a term used at all. How much re-engineering are we doing processes? And I know one of the processes I talked about is our trash baskets that overflow as like a volcanic cone right now, which are street services which would greatly reduce, yet can we re-engineer to have sanitation because the cost of that trash coming out of the trash can on the corner of uh, Normandy and 3rd Street will only enhance uh, the cost of sanitation when it's in the drain stuck. We, we are making that recommendation. Okay. It's one of the 50 recommendations. And uh, street cleaning is, has a possibility to go from street services to sanitation? We're, we're recommending that you ask us to study that further uh, for ultimately moving that to the sanitation department. Right. In addition to that, we are recommending creating a separate department of sanitation altogether right. to bring in some of those additional services that are being uh, carried by the other bureaus. This would allow those other bureaus to focus on what their core missions are, so whether it's uh, street resurfacing or the other uh, functions that they currently have. 
Right, and then also another motion that I put in that I think you addressed it on personnel issues. Our personnel department is a very important function. And the personnel department has a very difficult time as people come and go and, and move and all of that. Uh, would you pull from departments under 200 people or whatever, 150, whatever the number is, small departments, their HR function and put it into personnel? That is a recommendation. We are recommending moving t towards a consolidated uh, human resources department, much like what other jurisdictions are doing throughout the country. It's a much more specialized field than it was 20 years ago. Uh, and we are recommending doing that in two phases, looking at a combination of big departments and small departments for the first phase, um, starting July 1st, and then expanding it out to the rest of the city in the second phase. Right. And is any other in, uh National Cities Today or whatever magazine comes out that you read, those journals. Is any uh, restructuring done in other cities that have had uh, the opportunities to give you fresh ideas? Are you looking at obviously those things, but I think we should bring all those to the table. The one thing I do remember that was he's now I think the governor of Maryland, but he was the mayor of Baltimore O'Malley. And I remember reading once in one of those journals how they would bid jobs straight up. And I think in Cleveland did it too where they would bid jobs, uh, city forces and private forces, to get the best cost for the payer, uh, the taxpayer of the, of the municipality. Do we have any of that function here? Um, we are recommending strengthening our, our contracting practices um, and using managed co competition, which is what is, is, right. is a way of, of framing that issue uh, on an ongoing basis, particularly when it comes to one-time revenue. You know, if we receive any amount of one-time revenue, our recommendation is that instead of building up our workforce uh, that will be that could be paid for out of that one-time revenue, right. we use manage competition instead uh, bring in a private vendor to do that work so when that revenue goes away we we're not in the situation where we're, we bring in folks that we can't maintain creating a scenario where we have to then furlough everybody else to maintain that work right and I know this is a, a city from Chatsworth to San Pedro from Boyle Heights to Venice but are there ways to create neighborhood benefit assessment districts if people want to pay additional services like they do in the business districts could we look at those forms? Uh, we met with a, a, a community this morning in Public Works Street Services to try to create some of those things. If you can look at that. Thank you for this report. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. LeBonge. Mr. Rosendahl is our next speaker, followed by Mr. Kuretz. Mr. Rosendahl. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, you're doing a great job, and I appreciate And these are the roughest of times, and I just think people need to appreciate the hard work you and your team are doing. Thank you. Okay, five quick questions in the, on the police. Come on over there, my, my great friend and colleague from the 11th District. Okay, and just throwing it out as an idea, okay, and I know the union needs to hear this. Um, uh, you know, when I was in the military, um, we went up to um, Command Sergeant Major, and then there were lieutenants and captains and, and above. Uh, presently in the police department, a lieutenant is in a bargaining unit, and they get paid for overtime. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, and do we know if, if there's a discussion? I know I don't want to talk out of school and close session, all that kind of stuff. Is, has it ever been surfaced the idea that maybe a lieutenant, which is an officer, uh, uh, you know, could be part of the captain part and not get paid for overtime? And how much money would we save? Well, I can't answer that question about how much we save right off the top of my head, but what, okay. what, what, let me, what bargaining unit they're in is up to them. I uh, know. I'm, I'm saying I would suggest to the bargaining unit that lieutenants are officers uh, and that maybe they shouldn't get paid for overtime, or at least should be raised enough to be discussed as part of the discussion when we need to come up with a hundred million plus from the police department when we go into our next budget. We've got to come up with money. Right now, nobody's getting any real money for overtime. The question is how, bi how big a bank they're building. That's up. what I'm talking yeah. about. Okay. So can we look into that yeah, and, we can and find at least in the public you. forum have a discussion on yeah. that? Okay. Uh, I just want to again go back to able-bodied officers doing civilian work. Um, where are we at that number? How many sworn officers who are able-bodied are doing civilian work? The last number was like 86, of which 29, I believe. In, uh, 86, 29? Well, could you no, give us 86 a officers doing civilian work, and only 29 of them were not either 
temporary or long-term um, light duty. Okay, Miguel, I'd like a report back on that with the exact numbers on that. Jailers, are we going to be okay thanks to Mr. Smith's generosity this year? We, we got the jailer issue off the boards. Do we have a plan to deal with that next fiscal year? We, the chief has assigned 88 officers to the jail on a rotating six-month basis, and this allowed the generosity of Councilman Smith allowed us to remove, I think, 27 from that plan. Starting July 1st, if the funds aren't there, we'll go, we'll go back to the 88. Well, we got to go back to that and have yeah. a discussion on that yeah. one as well. Okay. Uh, the mechanics, how about that? How are we on the mechanics, police mechanics? Very thin. We have, you know, a hiring plan for next year. Can I have some silence, please? We're right at the margin because they leave to go to DWP and other places where they don't have furloughs and they have, but they feel greater jobs. Okay, I want to get a report back on that. We're, in our hiring plan, we have for next year to hire, I think, 10... Uh, or 11 mechanics so that we can try to keep up with okay. the first Whatever the story is, the facts will be helpful for us as we get sure. into that phase. The next sure. thing is 911. Um, obviously, we discussed about this. Uh, obviously, a 911 is core policing business. It is not a joke. It is the number we call when we're in need. And uh, I would obviously like to get more understanding of how we're going to deal with that issue next year. We, we will do that. We have asked for uh, exemptions from furloughs for the 911 officers. If they were exempted, Starting April 1st, uh, only the ones that answer the 911 calls, that's the floor people, we would, it would cost the city about $431,000. Okay. $431,000 to do 911, we got to find it somewhere. No, I don't want to be not, on hold. To not furlough them. So, yeah, that's what yeah. I'm saying. For the rest of this year, I mean, only this fiscal year. I understand. So we need to figure that and, one out. And the last thing I want is somebody dial 911 and we can't answer it. And they're one of the only groups that actually has to be paid cash overtime. So we, in the long run, it might be saving of money because we have a full service. Okay. And we have uh, uh, relief people. Okay. I like it fleshed out more because it's too serious for me. Now, and the last thing is just a comment. Uh, I think, you know, we're going to do the April class. The letters went out that 45 more people are going to join. There's no way we should do another class this year, fiscal year, so that we can save on what the voters voted on in March. And we should really prepare ahead for July 1st to July 2nd. That was what the Budget and Finance Committee that's right. recommended. And if, the, if that's the council's wish, that's how we'll proceed. Okay, I just want to, because this is a more public room, lights are on, people can hear us and see us and all that. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank thank you. Mr. Kretz is our next speaker, then Ms. Hart, and then Mr. Zion is on cue the second time. Yeah, I, I think uh, the first thing I was going to say has already been covered to some degree by Mr. Rosendahl, which is uh, it strikes me that there can't be anything that has a more d direct connection to saving lives than 911. So, if there's anything in the entire budget that I would say is the absolute first priority, is it is that there'd be no waiting for people answering 911 calls. So, frankly, I don't care what else is happening with this budget. I think tomorrow we should be back at full strength on 911, and people should not be waiting a second to have those calls answered. So the, my question to, to, to the department, to our CAO, is how do we make that happen? If the, if the city council, however the process is, assuming it's the city council, allows us to exempt um, the people answering the 911 calls, and, that, to, we, and then gives us the 431,000, that will we'll do it immediately. But what's happened during the year is that the city council on a number of occasions has adopted different policies and then told us to find the funds for it. We don't have it. As you heard Monday, we're, we're now have a projected deficit of three million, I think, 3.4 or something like that. And we're going to have to try to make it up. Everything else that gets piled onto us just increases our burden. We, we were asked at Budget and Finance to I try to find funding to take all of street services off of furloughs. And so in that exercise, we found a number of special uh, funding sources that, that are very important uh, but haven't been in, entirely spent 100%. Um, the only way, as Mr. Parks indicated, if you, if you fund something, you're gonna, we need to find another place to cut. Um, and so what remains is really, you know, very limited choices. Uh, there's 1.2 million left in the special events fee subsidy. There's um, 
the fire department has about 250,000 left in its special training fund that hasn't been encumbered now, but I'm sure it will be. Um, to there, in the case of street services, the goal was to try to eliminate them all out of furloughs. It would have been a 1.5 million dollar target. If we expanded furlough days for everybody, that would be uh, for those who are currently experiencing 26 days for one day, we would say 1.6 million dollars. So our our options are limited in terms of what we could do um, beyond because we whatever funding we had left we're using to mitigate the 50 million dollar deficit that we're currently experiencing and we're still short by four million well if the, if there was one thing that we have to resolve I, I don't care whether we take it from our reserves for this one item it would be my last choice and I'm sure we could find something else to do you have to bring us back some options and we have to do this I think not answering 911 calls is absolutely insane um, I have more stuff to discuss, but I'll push my button again. But that one item, I don't care where it comes from. You can't, you can't have life-saving calls not answered, and especially when, when we know that particularly uh, uh, Spanish-speaking people are getting worse service on emergency, life-saving calls. Uh, all those things are just not, not acceptable. There's no way we can do that as a city. Ms. Hahn is our next speaker. Thank you. I know this uh, it more pertains to next fiscal year, but I just wanted to, um, and I know the neighborhood councils are actually coming in to make their budget uh, suggestions and proposals, and so uh, I've introduced a motion just to ask you to take a good hard look at their proposals and uh, analyze them and see whether or not uh, you know some of them are really worth implementing in terms of efficiency, cost savings, and, and sort of long-term solutions. Have you had a chance to look at them at all? Um, no, I have not. But we will make sure. I, I did meet with them a couple of times, as did my staff. So we have a sense of elements of it, but I haven't had a chance. Um, my staff put this together in the context of also putting the budget together. So uh, we'll make sure that that analysis gets done. I think they're presenting today, right? Uh, or next next week, I believe. They're, they're coming. Okay. They're, right. Can have some time in council to present their their findings. Okay. So just know that I'm, I'm introducing a motion that, that specifically directs you to you know look at them. And so when they present it, we'll be able to provide you our comments on it. Okay. Mr. Dennis P. Soon to be roasted, Zion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Weston. Informs me not to talk long on this. Um, enough with the police department for the time being. How about the city attorney's office? Uh, I know that we got to report civil cases out of 41. I think they won 38, saving the city $700 million. What do we do to strengthen the city attorney's office so they can do their job defending the actions of the city employees on those civil cases where they need to go in and clean up the mess that's created by another department and we keep on cutting more and more away? How do we solve that? And we've got Mr. Carter here from the city attorney's office who can also maybe comment on that. Mr. Carter, could you come forward, please? Uh, Mr. Carter will be able to answer specifically. You know, one of the things that, you know, ultimately I think we need to look at is shifting uh, how litigation costs are, are spent. You know, uh, it's much like employees. Currently, when you hire an employee as a general manager, you're not 100% responsible for that employee. You, you cover about 60% of their costs. 40% of it ultimately gets paid for by the general fund through pensions, health care, and a variety of other services. Litigation is the same. Litigation is, regardless of where the litigation stems from, which department, um, the cost is dealt with with the entire general fund. If departments were accountable for their own litigation in terms of up to a certain threshold, so if I there was a, a, case, a employment discrimination case in my office, and I handled it poorly, which resulted from being, you know, a case that could have been resolved immediately to a case that resulted in maybe a million dollar uh, lawsuit against the city. If there was a way of spreading that accountability throughout departments, 
departments would be different, handle those cases different from the onset and, and would partner with the city attorney to avoid a, a small case becoming a big case and engage in a series of corrective actions to ev eventually learn from those cases. I think ultimately if we're trying to control litigation costs, which is a very legitimate goal, changing that model will help us get there. Um, the department is certainly at a better place to talk about how to strengthen the department, so I'll turn to Mr. Carter. I just want to say that uh, for my nine years here, when we first got here, we'd have civil cases come before us with the city attorney's office. There wouldn't be a representative from the department that generated that lawsuit, and we finally pounded, pounded, and pounded to get the department there, whether it's a slip and fall or something else, finally they will send a representative, but in the years past, We'd make the, the claim would come, we'd pay it, and well, how are we going to correct the problem if we don't know, and the department's not even here to defend themselves or their actions? Mr. Carter. Uh, good morning. William Carter, Chief Deputy, City Attorney's Office, uh, Honorable President, Council Members. The, I have in front of me a uh, top ten departments with the highest liability payouts. Uh, I won't name the departments, but... Why don't you go ahead and name them? Start off with okay, the alphabetical. Ask. Uh, the police department uh, is always number one. Uh, currently, as of December 31st, from July 1st of 09, uh, of 10 till December 31st of last year, there's been over f almost $15 million in payouts. And can, are those cases internal or are those cases external? In other words, internal conflicts or lawsuits from the public? Those are uh, both. Both okay. lawsuits that have been... Uh, brought because of use of force, traffic accidents, maybe employment. Uh, I won't give you the projected number for this year because we're still in the middle of negotiating and re resolving cases. Uh, we have Public Works, Bureau of Street Services at four million, Transportation at three million, Rec and Park at 1.6, Fire at about 600,000, Bureau of Sanitation and goes down from there. Um, What's the lowest? Lowest is uh, the convention center, which was thirty thousand dollars in payouts. Okay. Yes, but that was of December thirty-first of last year. These numbers are actually lower than from the year before. So uh, the city attorney's office has been working hard to negotiate lower settlements and to try those cases that we feel we can't settle. And what are they doing for risk management so it doesn't reoccur? Well, risk management is an obligation of each department. Each department should be sure they are supposed to come before the claims board and the council to make sure that the offending situation or the, the risk situation has been abated. Uh, I'm not sure if that's happening. It seems to me that we have an awful lot of the same types of incidents. We're trying to deal with the departments on a case-by-case -case basis to train them to do so. But as uh, Council Member Zine, you mentioned, since July 1st uh, of last year, our trial teams have had 41 jury trials. We've had favorable verdicts out of 38 of those. In fact, uh, I think some of the former officer defendants that are in this are here today. Just last week, our trial teams fully defended them in federal court, and there was no liability found on the behalf of the police department and no damages awarded. Total savings to the city is over $70 million by our trial teams. That's real money. That's real money that would have had been paid by the city because those are the demands made by the plaintiffs who sue us. And those are your attorneys, not outside counsel? These are our attorneys, our lawyers that are working around the clock. And remember, all of our lawyers are furloughed, but the courts aren't furloughed, the juries aren't furloughed, the police aren't furloughed, the criminals aren't furloughed. We have to work every day. And the judges don't accept our excuse that we're furloughed. We have to show up. But so your, your budget is over the, uh, according to... Well, we have a disagreement. We have a major disagreement with the FSR. We, as I've handed out today materials, uh, a letter dated March 23rd with some attachments. Uh, we believe that the uh, current deficit is overstated by the FSR. We think our final deficit year in number is overstated. We believe if we weren't to if we weren't to do anything else the rest of the year, our final deficit would be about 1.8 million. That's what we believe based on our current uh, track uh, record on uh, the budget. You have to remember that this our office got hit harder than any other public safety department. 
We got hit 10%. We got hit harder than the police, har harder than the fire. And I found it interesting today when you were talking about minimum police numbers. We have to keep a certain number of police officers out there. I never hear you need to keep the same amount of prosecutors. You have to, we're part of the same equation. The police are only as good as the prosecutors. The police don't keep criminals in jail. The prosecutors do. You can arrest as many people as you want. You can't hold them. The strongest thing you have in the city against criminals is the complaint that the prosecutor files. That's what holds that person in jail. So every time we get cut, you have to cut a prosecutor. That's what you're doing. And when you're trying to keep a minimum number of police officers, you've got to factor prosecutors into it. That's just common sense. And you're not, you're, you, I'm, we're asking you to think about that. Now, having said that, we also have the civil component of the office, which you've talked about. There were guidelines set last year, revenue targets for collections, subrogation, consumer environmental penalties. We are hitting all of our targets. You, Council President and others asked us, would you uh, accept these targets, collection, subrogation, penalties? We are hitting our targets. We will use those numbers to balance our budget. And we're doing that also with furloughs. We're doing it with transferring to proprietaries. We're doing everything we can to balance our budget. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Rosendahl. We, we, we have this uh, dance every FSR, and I think that's why we asked the controller to issue um, the, her report, where she will ultimately be the arbitrator of, of what, what the deficits are. I'm, I'm very hopeful that, in fact, the, the city attorney will be able to meet his budget, uh, and ultimately the controller who controls our, our bank account will, will give us that final indication um, as we move forward in the rest of the fiscal year. And if I could add, Melissa Kranz, Office of the CAO, uh, one of the discrepancies between our office's report and the city attorney's reported deficit is the assumption of realizing some of the operational plan solutions. And uh, to that end, uh, there is a, a recommendation to appropriate about $1.8 million uh, to city attorney's 1010 account from the Consumer Protection Litigation Fund. Uh, in the operational plan, there's about $4.2 million expected. Of course, we can't recommend appropriations until that money is there. Mr. Rosenbaum? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Just another uh, uh, LAPD question rather quickly I'd like to ask um, um, Jerry. Um, it has to do with, with chargeback and, and payment. Uh, when, when we uh, provide our LAPD service to LAUSD police, uh, to the port police, and to the airport police on, on booking uh, and housing suspects and all that, uh, do we get reimbursed from those three groups? And how much money might we be looking at that we should get reimbursed? I, I'd have to do it. Uh, I know we don't get reimbursed from the port or the airport. I don't believe, I'd have to check with USC, I don't believe we do. Um, and it's, but it's not that many people. And the highway patrol? Uh, the highway patrol usually doesn't book them with us to go right to the sheriffs. Okay, because I'd like to report back, because I think the airport right. should pay for its own issues, and so should the harbor, the proprietary departments, and LAUSD. I've heard a figure as much as 84 million with, with no, LAUSD. No. Um, our, our, Total. Our booking expenses, uh, with transportation and booking fees is under $5 million. Okay. So I can't imagine how it could be right, that great. high. Okay, well, and of that percentage, I would guarantee you it's in the single digits of people from the places you're talking about. It's probably under five, It's probably in the 2 3% range, okay. which would well, be next to nothing. It, it, it could help us if the proprietor... Well, the problem is, one of the problems we've had, and, and it would, this has come up in the past, how do we collect? Because right now we're trying, we, because of the way the city's doing things and consolidating. For example, we get about 300 plus thousand a year out of drunk driving fines, driving under the influence. Yeah. The Office of Finance used to do that. Now they're requiring us to do it, so we have to try to figure out a way how we can set up a collection system. So just finding a place to collect money is only one part of the problem. Then we have to find people to collect it for us. Yeah. So it's just, I just want to say. There may be something there, but it's just not, it's not as easy as it always okay. appears at well, first place. If there's something there, I'd love to get it. Okay. Okay, thanks. Ms. Koretz. 
Sure. Yes. Yes. Uh, my, my other question is about uh, police staffing. Yes, I know we've had this, this, we've discussed this a little bit. We, we have a magic number, 9963. Has there been an analysis? Is there something magical about that? If we decided to cut a class and, and uh, establish a level that was 50 officers lower, you would tell us the sky is falling, as we kind of already have heard. Um, if we cut it 10 officers and made it 99.53, I don't know if we'd get the same response. We're, is there any kind of analysis that has told us that this number is a magical number and this is a magical level of deployment? The chief of police has stated that 9963 is a number he be, a minimum number he believes that will allow us to keep providing the service we have, which is a reduction in uh, crime across the board. Uh, have we analyzed what happens if it's 99.62? No. Uh, would I say if it's 9,900 that the sky is falling? That's not the way I talk. But what I would say is that it will impinge upon some of the things we're doing because it's just less people to apply to those places. What, right now, you have to understand that what the chief has done in the last a little over a year that he's been chief, he has moved 400 people out of administrative and special units back into patrol to beef up the patrol units. He has streamlined the operations to try to make sure that every available, every able-bodied police officer is doing the kind of police work that he or she should be doing. Anytime you start removing people from that deployment, and we've lost 400 a month because of the overtime agreement, anytime you keep adding to that, you, as well, he's gone, but as the chief administrator officer says, when you take from one place, it's going to impact some other place. Can I give you a one-to-one? -one? No, but can I, I can just tell you that there will be some units that will suffer with the less people. That's what we're going through right now. The less people we have, the less specialized units we can have. That includes, um, and that also requires us to, to do different things. In the past, he, the police department, when there was a traffic accident, the police officer showed up to take a report. Not anymore. In the past, when there was a burglary, somebody would show up right away. We don't do that anymore. I don't want us to be in the position where we can't investigate burglaries and auto thefts because we have to put people in all the homicide and violent crime units. That's a long answer to your question. It's not one-to-one, -one, but it is. The less people we have, the less service we can provide. Right. That's Intuitively, that's true, but I suspect if we had... 200 more officers, we'd probably be saying exactly the same thing. If we had well, a couple hundred fewer officers, we'd probably be saying the same thing. Is, is there a real point where we actually face some real difficulties? I know that's not ideal, but we have cut overtime dramatically, um, and there's there's uh, you know not a person here that doesn't think our our chief has done an amazing job. But the fact is we've cut overtime dramatically, we've cut that deployment, and we've found a way to keep crime down. So the question is, could we, could we cut 10 officers, and would no. the people of Los Angeles actually know the difference? Where, where is, do, do we know a line where we actually have a sense that people would notice the difference? And if you tell me that if we cut 10 officers and we cut one thousandth of one percent of the force that any any practical difference would be there and we couldn't change deployment to cover it over I'd find it hard to believe so I'd like to know that we've done some real analysis and that we actually know that 9963 is really a number that we can't go below um, or or whether we could deal with with budgeting uh, of this department in a way that other cities like Long Beach do, where they've decided they are going to keep the same percentage for their police department, but if they continue to fund it at exactly the same level and keep their deployment, as as a council member there has told me, they become the police department of Long Beach and not the city, as we keep cutting every other service. So you know what I'm getting at is, is, can we in some way do some analysis to really figure out 
whether the police department can take a hit along with everybody else, or whether that one budget has to be sacrosanct while we cut other highly important services. Well, I, I, let me just answer it in a number of ways. First of all, if we wanted to have a police department that really should be fully staffed, we'd have 12,000, 12,500. Right, and a bankrupt city. We all know we I, can't do that. I, second thing is, the number 9963 was arrived at after doing an analysis of deployment, where we were, where people were, um, based on the production the department was achieving, the reduction in crime that has gone down in Los Angeles, even when crime in other cities has gone up. The question of whether you change... Asking us to talk about one police officer, ten police officer, is the kind of things we lawyers do when we want to make a point in our argument. And you've made the point that, yes, there are numbers you can play with. The chief of police, and I know the mayor, honestly believes that 9963 is a minimum. Anytime you start going below that, which we have done, we have to move people around to make up for that. that that's the best answer I can give you, and the best answer to that, the best corollary to that is with this number we have been able to achieve substantial reductions in crime the city council is the policy makers that's something you have to decide as to what is the priorities for the city in setting your budget right now we're about 25 percent of the general fund budget and 30 percent of the general fund people keeping us at 9963 doesn't make us the police department of the city the Police Department of Los Angeles. We are at 25 percent. Our budget for next year will probably be will be in the same range. I know what my instructions have been from everybody. So I think the best answer I can give you is 9963 is the best estimate we can give to keep the police department performing the way it is. Well, it could could we not take a different approach, which would be to gradually reduce by attrition. And if we found that our deployment was too low, um, to increase while we were increasing by training and, and hiring new officers, to fill that in with overtime as we have. Well, so to test the waters, as it were, because it is possible, since we, we have had a reduction in deployment and maintained incredible level of, of success in fighting crime, that... 9,700 might be able to do the job virtually as well, um, before, and, that, and that there is a point where we start to see a difference. And we don't know that 9,963 is it. So could we, for the purposes of a budget that is, is so deeply in debt, um, experiment with that and, and slowly nip at the edges and see whether, whether we have any real difference? If you try to do it that way, in my opinion, it would end up costing more because overtime is more expensive than having a police officer because you have to pay time and a half. Well, Stop. not with pension costs and all the other costs. No. As we know, it's no. probably pretty much of a lot. Um, and second of all, it takes a while to train officers and we can't train classes of hundreds. That's what they, in one of the findings of the um, Rampart, I don't know what it was called, I think it was called Rampart incident report that the Chief Parks did, one of the findings was that when you have these large classes and you hire a whole bunch of people at one time, you can get in trouble because you're not, they're not getting the individual Right, training. and that's not what I'm suggesting. As well, you know, I'm suggesting that you very slowly trip down and it, if, you well, see, if you see you start to run into problems, you gradually fill it in with overtime and then you gradually rehire and staff okay, we, We've debated this for a while. Okay. It's, uh, by six minutes over, so Mr. Kretz, if you want to push your button again, please. Well, just a thought as we look towards uh, our budget for July 1st. Thank you. Mr. Wesson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and members. I'd like to ask Mr. Carter to come forward again, if, if, if I could, and then Miguel, maybe you could help me sort, sort this out. Where it relates to your department collecting uh, uncollectible debt or and you reference a, a target of of three million dollars or what have you how did we come up with the three million dollar figure was that 
That, that was a number that was negotiated before this office, this administration took office. That has been in effect for at least a couple years. The, in each budget that I saw uh, was a recommendation that a revenue target number of $3 million for collections. Last year we hit about $3.5 million. This year we'll probably hit over $4 million, maybe more. Last week we had a victory of about $10 million. The issue now is to collect it. And that was uh, in response, actually, to a CAO report that came out in October of 2009 in our discussions with President uh, Garcetti that said we should incentivize the departments. And we said one of those areas is certainly collections. We've transferred five people in the collections. And in response to the CAO and the council, our attorneys are working very hard to hit that $3 million number. And when we hit that number, we anticipate that we will get some credit for that. Mr. Santana, I remember. That's right. I don't know if it was several months ago or last year, we were talking about this large amount of uncollectible. I can't remember the figure. It was uh, Council Member Alicon that said, and I think Ms. Hahn as well. Uh, so I guess my question is, in my view, if the public or somebody that owes us some money got a, a letter from the firm of Coretz, Wesson, and Kikorian saying pay up, that they might take it and just throw it in the trash. But if they got uh, a letter from the city attorney's office, you know, saying, hey, we're going to sue you, if that's, do you view that as a more effective way? If so, then there, if there hasn't been discussions, there should be serious discussions about increasing the CA, uh, the, the uh, city attorney's office ability to collect these funds. I met with Carmen <coughs> about a month ago and he said to me, you should let me be your bill collector. So I'm just curious as to what you think on that. I would love to come up with at least some kind of pilot program that would afford them the opportunity to go out and bring in the money that's uh, due us. I, I think uh, the concept's a good one. I think the, the goal here is our collection system goes through different processes and ultimately they, some of them end up in the city attorney's office for that purpose. I think w what we don't do a good job as a city is making sure we capture the collections uh, at the front end and so the ones that the city attorney is going after are really the ones where that letter will make the biggest impact. And so uh, as part of uh, this issue, there was a separate report that was issued, if you remember, from the, the core committee, which was established uh, simply to look at that one issue. And um, an IG type of position for that goal to streamline that process so that every piece of the you know, every every piece of that collection gets handled at the appropriate place and ultimately creates a person whose sole purpose is to advocate for uh, the streamlining of that effort. Um, and so the city attorney is, you're right, I mean that's, when I was uh, down the street, you know, we saw that in child support. Right, a letter from um, uh, often from from the DA would make that you know it would go from the bottom of the pile to the top of the pile, and I think the same is true here at the city. And the the, the only thing, and then I, I will I will sit down. Um, I'd like to see or discussion where it relates to maybe their involvement in the front end. Because I think if you immediately, you know, go after the individuals that owe us money, and that if they're involved, they're going to recognize that the city of, of Los Angeles is serious. Now, I don't know what agencies we use or how that works, but I do think that there are some things that, that the city attorney's office has been recommending that might bring in more revenue and I, I would like to really see us uh, get involved with those kinds of things. I'm really glad that we're going to have serious discussions about consolidations of departments and maybe things like uh, what are, maybe we're not good at running golf courses, maybe we're not good at running the uh, convention center. And I mean so let's, I, I really want to see what those figures are but where it relates to tax collection I would be really, I think this 
this council would be very open to at least some kind of pilot program. And if our city attorney's office can bring in more money, then maybe they should be our bill collectors. Thank you, Mr. Weston. You're only 244 over. Appreciate that. I, I Mr. Cardenas. <laughs> it was less than two minutes. Yes, it was. <laughs> you got five more minutes. Um, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Cardenas. Your time is up. Th thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I think it's important that, that we use this opportunity to not only talk about this year's budget, but also warn ourselves as a body, as policymakers, that we're really charged with setting the budget for the city of Los Angeles right here in these chambers. And uh, I believe that too much has been overemphasized from many, many corners of this city um, in that quality public safety lies in 9,963 officers. First of all, I've asked time and time again for somebody to please let me know where the 9,963 number comes from and how that particular figure is so exact. Um, and I still haven't had an answer. Hopefully during the future budget process for next year, we'll actually be able to understand why that magical number is so important. But at the same time, I think it's important for us to understand and remind ourselves that when it comes to public safety, that's an effort by an entire team of folks. Yes, we need at the core of that is our police officers. But as we heard earlier from our police service uh, representatives, uh, such as our 9-11 operators, we heard that they're part of that public safety as well. Um, it's one thing to make sure that an officer shows up uh, on the scene whenever something like a shooting has occurred. But at that moment, once a shooting has occurred and there's blood spilled, then it's just as critical for public safety, especially the safety and the life of that particular individual or individuals whose blood is spilling, that we actually have the resources and we're fortifying ourselves with the ability to not waste any time whatsoever to get to that individual or those individuals and save their lives. So I think it's really important for us to understand that we need to uh, appreciate and respect the efforts and the work that's being done within the police department because it's not a science per se and it's not magic as to how a police department can remain effective and highly functional but at the same time when we're actually cutting budget, budgets all over the city of Los Angeles it's important for us to understand that we can't leave any department we can't leave any department without them having to justify every single position, every single dollar that we, we fortify them with. The police department doesn't get to choose how many positions they have. It's the City Council of Los Angeles every year during the budget process that gets to decide how many positions they have in sworn officers and also how many positions they have in non-sworn officers, civilian positions, and all the related support uh, issues that go with any particular department. So I just wanted to remind ourselves as the policymakers of the budget of the City of Los Angeles that it's really important that we not ignore, that we actually require every single department to justify every single position. And with all due respect, I think that we've been very, very light on the police department. And it's not their fault that if we're light on them, then they don't have to give us the kinds of details that every other department has to fight for. Thank you. Mr. Garcetti. Thank you. I, I will be uh, brief. Thank you, colleagues, for the, the good and vigorous discussion. But thank you to our CIO for um, two things. Today we're passing, you know, a plan that essentially gets us through the rest of the year, the two months with the adjustments we have to make as we go along. And because of the good work of this council and the CAO and the mayor, we were able to make cuts uh, in previous months that get us close to being there. This will finish that for the year. What we aren't going to get in is deep today, and we've actually scheduled, I think, for another week, beginning hopefully next week, is the four pillars of what the CAO says is sustainability for the next three years. Um, for anybody who is looking at the city of Los Angeles and says, are they just reacting? I would say no. We've actually been acting pretty consistently. And we've asked our CAO, who's produced a very impressive um, route forward, something that, you know, the CAO works for both the mayor and the council. When we look for an overall plan, it has to come out of the CAO's office as we help guide that and refine that plan. 
that is something that I think should be impressive, whether it's for our bond raters or whether it's for our constituents. In the meantime, they've been very involved in our labor negotiations as well. I mean, to be blunt, folks, we can do a lot on our service side depending on what sort of negotiations and settlement we have on our labor contracts. And I look forward to continuing that path and thank the CAO for the progress uh, that we've made in those areas. And, you know, we can get to a place where um, we both have to make new cuts, but we might be able to move completely away from furloughs for everybody, not just for um, 911 operators, not just for those critical positions. And I know that's what we have to do because we all know that furloughs are not a permanent fix. They are not structural. We cannot run a city uh, sometimes open and sometimes not. What we can do is make the hard decisions about what core things the city should do and should not be doing. And that's what we're going to have to all do still. And I think the work that your analysts did in each department, for each of us who chair different committees that oversee those departments, you need to really dig into those and be the leader. Be the leader for uh, you know, cultural affairs. Be the leader for uh, rec and parks. Be the leader for transportation. Be the leader at public works. Be the leader um, in planning. And, and determine what it is that we can do so that we do have the core of what the city is about sustained. And, and what we've done is we've kind of lopped off everybody so the things that produce revenue uh, aren't producing them as well as they, they can. Things that might be secondary or tertiary responsibilities we're still doing even though we can't afford to. So let's finish this year, plug this hole, move this forward. I'm really glad there's a consensus and some understanding we can do things intelligently, finally, in the police department on this stuff. And I don't mean that the police department hasn't been intelligent. We've just reduced it usually to this either-or debate that I think we get past, or the beginning of it today. Um, we need to continue to look at those responsibilities in those areas where we can get more revenues, whether it's the city attorney's office, the office of finance, um, and give those resources to make sure our collections and everything else do move forward. We can't just keep saying that. Um, and some of us are working very hard to make sure that that uh, happens, that the recommendations of the core commission, for instance, are enacted so that we can get that. And then finally, I, I really want to appreciate, I think when people have heard silence out there in terms of our labor relations, it's because we're talking. And that it reflects the way that it should be, uh, the way that we get to, you know, it, it's a lot of fireworks and I know our friends in the fourth estate don't like it as much and some people in interest groups don't like it as much and we're not fighting. Um, when Schwarzenegger fought up in uh, Sacramento uh, with his um, uh, public safety unions, it created a lot of good headlines and at the end of the day, guess what, they got to the same place we negotiated and passed overwhelmingly by the voters in Measure G. We can do better and I think we have a better way of doing business here and hopefully we'll make some good progress in the days to come there because at the end of the day, for whether it's the street services folks, and thank you to Mr. Rezar for working together with me on that, uh, whether it is the, uh, the 911 operators, there is a way that we can do that. It isn't, by the way, with no concessions, which I did hear today, like, please exempt us from furloughs and all concessions. We all have tightened our belts. We've all given something, but we do that because we believe in the service, we believe in what we do, we believe in the mission of ultimately serving the people of L.A., and this is a good way forward, and I look forward to Mr. Parks helping guide the discussion on those core pieces of the department, working with the CAO to do the same things. That's what our budget deliberations should focus on uh, once and for all, and make those final cuts and those decisions that will guide us into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garcetti. Mr. Labonge, for the second time. Thank you, Eric, for your help in all things. Appreciate that. I just wanted to stand I support what Mr. Wesson said about the city attorney. I think we should really look at that. I also think if a city attorney's representative here, a city controller's representative should be here, as well as a mayor's representative should be here at the table, because it's all a team. What they're talking about in Washington, what they're not doing, is trying to bring everybody together, but everybody's not necessarily together. So in these coming weeks and months, maybe we could we be together. But I appreciate what Mr. Carter said, because I think our city attorney could extradite an a, a, a effort that would be successful in a way that we want to see. No disrespect to the Office of Finance or whatever has gone on before. And we have asked for Office of Finance and Treasurer to maybe be combined. Maybe that could be, we could look at some of these things, how they could work. If the city uh, clerk's office could do more in a way to help information spread to the people, let's look at that effort as well. I also want to say to the fine representative of the 5th District, it starts with public safety. And I think if we do uh, 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 upset public safety, we will not be successful. When you mentioned the Rampart Report, uh, Mr. Chaliff, when you mentioned the Rampart Report, that was a very, very strong uh, thought about how when the previous administration uh, Mr. Reardon, who I love, but he wanted to hire a thousand officers today. And we hired a thousand officers, but a few of those officers weren't representative of what the police department would be, and we got off course. So I think when you have that smaller uh, unit hire, it may be more successful to make sure they're ready to do the job. 
Everybody loved that one officer who caused all that trouble because he could hop that six foot outfield fence at Crystal Springs. That's what really turned him on, what an athlete that guy was, but he didn't have the character to be LAPD. I also wanted to say too, right now the police department uh, in our area, Mr. Koretz, is looking in the West Bureau to combine units if it makes more sense, which is uh, uh, instead of having uh, every division have a unit, they're going to go Bureau to save money. They're doing thinking in there, and that helps us as we go forward. Same looking at traffic and some other issues. So everything's on the table, but I think we need everybody in the room, including managers. And one thing over the city attorney, if I could ask for a quick question here. I'm worried, and I like that number, and Mr. Zion, you asked the question to get the top ten list of what it is. I was impressed with it so much lower than the previous administration of the city attorney. That shows that this city attorney is working aggressively as public lawyers and not hiring outside counsel to do it. Small thing. It starts with public safety, public works, other issues which we have not under our control, public health, public education, but on public works street lighting. A number of street lighting uh, issues. When there's an issue in the dark, sometimes we get a claim against us. I just want to make sure when there's an issue of bad roadways, we get a claim against us. I'm just putting a big plug in for public works to try to find a way because if rain weakens asphalt, asphalt creates potholes, potholes create problems. It's very basic. But on the issue of going after in a, in a firm way, I want to be a fine city, but not a fine city that they give fines to everybody, but a fine city like a clean city. That being said, how would you propose to be more effective in collecting outstanding debt and other issues? Well, I think the first thing that, that has to happen is a realistic assessment of what the outstanding debt is. I've heard numbers from 200 to $400 million. It's not that high. It's, it's not that high. I think there's a difference between the assessed value and then the audited value. In my discussions with the Office of Finance, which have been very cordial, and I, I, I have to give great support that acknowledge the great support that the Office of Finance has provided to the City Attorney's Office. We work very closely with them. In my discussions with them, and I think they would confirm that the outstanding debt that we think we could actually collect is probably somewhere between 85 and 90 million. Because a lot of this, I think that's it. I mean, that's from my Correct, but I think there has to be. I think there has to be a realistic assessment of what we can collect. A lot of that debt could be from people who wrote bad checks, small amounts, people you'll never be able to collect from. What we have to do is focus our sights on the realistic amount of money we can we can uh, collect and do it in an efficient way. As I've heard some of the council members say, and I, I, I fully support that, is we have to get the debt sooner. We have to get to that debt sooner. Within not months or years. It has to be weeks. By the time we, as, we understand and believe that we're not going to get that payment, we have to get on it right away so we can attach or put a lien on that debt and then take appropriate legal action. And I agree, a letter from the city attorney's office may get to the front or the top of the pile of bills to be paid. We've, uh, it's not glamorous. It's not the kind of things you typically think uh, a prosecution office wants to do, but my city attorney has made collections one of his top priorities. We're collecting as much as we can, and workers' comp, we're doing as much as we can. I think we can reduce a lot of debt if we can catch these people that are submitting false workers' comp claims. Uh, you know, we don't even talk about those cases. Those, we have about 10,000 of those cases. But I think the sooner we get the debt in-house, the sooner, the faster we can streamline the cases and, and get to the debtors, the sooner we can collect that money. Thank you, Mr. Carter. And there's a variety of things, whether it's the police department, the fire department, on the issue of public safety and that teamwork effort uh, on this issue here. I also want to say this, too, because I say it in public meetings. The tragedy that happened in, in the natural tragedy in Japan will come to Los Angeles and our preparedness and our apparatus, whether it's record parks for housing when there's a disaster, all the other things that take place there, we have to make sure we look at. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Mr. CAO and thank staff you, for this. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Labonge. Thank you. Mr. Kokorian, for the first time. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I just wanted to weigh in and make one comment on this issue of collections. Um, I think Mr. Wesson and, and others have made the very important point about our ability 
to recover more in what is owed to the city if we provide the city attorney with the ability to do that earlier on. But, but I want to also add that there's an there's another value to that, and that is uh, that it, func it focuses us more on our core functions. When there are other departments in the city, the fire department and countless other departments that are devoting resources to the collection of debts, that's taking time and energy away from that department's core function, when that, in fact, should, would more properly be done uh, in a department that, that would uh, be more appropriate to debt collection. So I think. Mr. Wesson's point is is a very important one, and I'd like to see uh, I'd like to see us have a much more robust discussion about this with the city attorney's specific recommendations, uh, and also the city uh, the CAO's recommendations about how we can consolidate those functions and create efficiencies, not just in the collection process itself, but also in taking those functions away from other uh, departments where they're currently. Uh, eating up human and, and financial resources. Thank you, Mr. Corian. Ms. Hahn. I'll speak for Ms. Hahn. She's coming in this door in just a moment, right here. Could you please hold the door, Sergeant, for Ms. Hahn? You got it. I got it. I got it. Thank you, Mr. Labonge. Thank you. I'd love it. We could go to Mr. Parks, but he's not there. There he is. Mr. Parks, you want to go ahead, or do you want to wait for Ms. Hahn? Thank you, uh, Mr. Go, go ahead, Mr. Parks. We'll come back to Ms. Hahn. Let, let me just uh, hopefully give everybody a little insight about collections over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, at one time, collections were in the city attorney's office. And because they were not a priority, they were moved to the Office of Finance because we were collecting. Since that has occurred, the Office of Finance has collected, and they go on ongoing, 400 to $440 million a year. The weakness of the system over time has been where executive order number five by the mayor has been ignored by departments. They're supposed to turn over, they're supposed to bill people and then turn it over within 60 days to off the finance. We've expanded the number of primary and secondary collection agencies to collect that money. When it comes back from those collection agencies from the secondary, there's only two choices. You either sell the debt because it's exhausted or you can go to the city attorney for the issue of, of uh, criminal. The other issue this council has approved is giving the Office of Finance the ability to put liens against people's property early on. The Office of Finance also uses letters from the city attorney and applying that to get pressure on people to pay. So as we move forward, the last piece of the puzzle that the council approved was dealing with a collection czar that was going to be the eyes and ears of everyone to determine what the collection. So those are things that we've approved and moved forward on. And I would hope that as we move forward, that we continue to see what the benefit of those collections have been. And so, uh, again, and also the Office of Finance has the ability to then do uh, the issue of, uh, uh, of having amnesty programs if people haven't paid. And then with the upcoming discussion about merging finance and treasure, there'll be even some more benefit as it relates to dealing with our whole financial system. So these are things that have occurred over the last 10 years that have incrementally put the city of LA in a position to be far more uh, adept at collecting money. Uh, clearly we saw several years ago from a couple of controller audits that the amount of money that was on the table was way over exaggerated. We found out on paramedic building, much of that that was caused, uh, restated as being owed was not even collectible. We also found in DOT that the issues dealing with the cost of uh, uh, collections were cumulative figures on loss of revenue that was because we historically have collected on uh, citations somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 to 85 percent of the revenue on citations. So that 15 percent, if you collectively look at that over 10 years, it looks like a lot of money. Much of it is uncollectible because people have re-registered their vehicles and a variety of other things. So again, we have to know what the real figures are. We need to make sure the departments get those dollars or those invoices into uh, to uh, finance. Finance with their, I think we're up to about seven or eight companies that are doing collections for the city and they're on contingency on what they can raise. The new implementation of the liens by finance will certainly serve additional uh, emphasis. And then the final part is once we get the collections are, 
on board, that's a set of eyes that all of us can depend on. So those are things that we've done over the last eight years I've been here. And before that, uh, there was many other issues. But again, realize that collections used to be in the city attorney's office in other administrations. And it was taken away because it fell so low on the priority list that you co collected barely nothing. And so I hope that we can continue the discussions and look at these issues. But let's not forget what we put in place incrementally that has shown some great benefit to the city and the number of dollars that are coming in is not by accident. It also gives the Office of Finance the ability that a high, a pretty good percentage of the money they collect are dollars in which they roll their sleeves up and get into the city as opposed to those who just comply naturally by paying their bills. So a pretty good percentage comes from them digging, from audits, and finding ways to get money in. And the amnesty programs over the last several years have been very beneficial to get money into the system. And so I would hope that as we move forward, a lot of these discussions will be held and we'd all invite, we'd invite you to come to Budget and Finance and we have these special meetings on these four pillars that we'll be bringing to the council as principals. We also ask you to come to the committees when we start talking about these 50 suggestions on reorganization, mergers, uh, different uh, view as to what our core responsibilities are and so that we can have a collective interest once it gets the council so that we clearly have a platform to work from at the same time, budget deliberations start in mid-April, and so hopefully many of these things will be addressed as we move forward because it's absolutely critical that we not only keep this current year in, in, in uh, the level of solvency, and one thing I don't think uh, Miguel mentioned, we're down to about $4 million as a shortfall today, but if revenues continue to recede, we'll be back here talking about additional cuts before June 30th. And whatever we don't solve this year, by June 30th, it will certainly be an issue that we have to solve after July 1st. And that's why it's important that we get so many of these things done before June 30th. And we hope also that we get the ordinances that are in play. Because I think in this report alone, there's at least 2 to $3 million of lost revenue due to the lack of having ordinances in place to collect the money on the date that was proposed are that we have not gotten the ordinance uh, yet. So those are things also that could bring significant revenue in because after actions by the council, those ordinances implemented. So I, I'd ask that we move this report uh, as uh, recommended by the Budget and Finance Committee and that we get prepared for a lot of discussion on financial issues over the next month or two. Uh, Mr. Smith, for the first time. Oh, Ms. Hahn, well, he's up and you were there, but now you're the second. Mr. Rosendahl's third, but go ahead, Ms. Hahn, and then we'll go to Mr. Smith. No, 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 protocol. Okay. Ms. Hahn, and then we'll go to Mr. Smith, then we'll go to Mr. Rosendahl. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, you know, um, I, I think the city attorney um, uh, bill, and first of all, I agree. Uh, if the city attorney wants to uh, help us with debt collection, I say absolutely. Zero from zero is zero. We don't have it now. We may not have it then, but we haven't lost anything. And if the city attorney really um, wants to take that on, I think you're right. And by the time it gets to your office, it's too late. Um, this is about collecting that money up front as soon as possible. And I think a strong letter from our city attorney uh, could make a difference. We don't know. But I, I am 100% behind that. I don't know if we need to make a motion or a recommendation or uh, what. But, uh, you know, I, I think that is something uh, that I am completely behind. You know, the other thing I was, when I was listening to you talk about, and by the way, you're right, um, Bill, about, you know, we're so insistent on protecting our firefighters and our police officers in terms of public safety, but our prosecutors are as much a part of that uh, formula as anything and neighborhood prosecutors by the way um, I'm a huge fan of and I wasn't in the very beginning and I wasn't sure why we were spending extra money for neighborhood prosecutors but neighborhood prosecutors along with senior lead officers in LAPD um, are the ones that actually can uh, prevent crime uh, and create a neighborhoods where there's a better quality of life. It's the broken window syndrome as far as I'm concerned with neighborhood prosecutors. So uh, I don't know how much of your budget has been um, taken away from the neighborhood prosecutor problem, but I think that's a big issue for the city. You can answer that. And then also, uh, I was going to ask you in terms of the, our settlement and liability, how much of that 
uh, under, I don't know if it was street services, is slip and falls of people tripping and falling on our sidewalks. I would say that's the vast majority. Yeah. Uh, slip and fall. And trip. that was about four million a year, I think, in in street services. You know. Well, that wasn't a year. That was oh. uh, the first six months. It was four million. So yes. possibly eight million, could ten be, million a year. I would say <clears throat> it could be in the ten million. Ten million, million a year. Uh, and, and you know, since I've been here on the council, it's ten years now. I, I'm sure that's a pretty consistent figure. So we're talking just since I've been here, about $100 million uh, that's gone to settle trip and falls. This has been frustrating for me, colleagues, and I know it has for a lot of people. And I remember when uh, Wendy uh, Gruel was sitting here, we, I believe we introduced a motion asking for an analysis of uh, just specifically trip and falls, and wouldn't we be better off fixing our sidewalks uh, as opposed to continuing this, um, you know, Li yeah, liability uh, that we have month after month, year after year. Um, I was frustrated this year. Many of you heard me uh, on the signal uh, at the at the Five Points corner uh, of the, of the Harbor City in San Pedro, uh, where the city attorney, uh, w you know, was talking about the payouts that we have paid for that one intersection and what conversations what we were having between city attorney, LAPD, DOT, um, and to solve these problems. I guess, Miguel, uh, for me, what are we doing going forward to really, once and for all, have a good, it's almost about what is our core services, yeah, what are we really good at, yeah, but how are we going to change this formula that keeps coming back year after year where it seems to me some upfront fixes uh, of, of these problems could certainly in the long run reduce uh, the settlements that we're paying out for these issues. And I know uh, the city attorney knows these figures. Uh, LAPD knows where the traffic problems are or accidents waiting to happen. Uh, you know, DOT knows where we should be placing different traffic calming issues or signals. Doesn't seem like it hits us until we're in closed session and we're paying out a settlement. Uh, it, to me, again, the structural deficit is one thing. This liability deficit uh, is uh, something else that just keeps growing. And I don't know. It's going to be about where do you find the money? Uh, but it seems to me this is one of those things where uh, you know, penny wise, but we're being pound foolish. And we're not solving these problems. The sidewalks is the biggest issue to me. Uh, not only is it a quality of life issue for every single neighborhood, but it is a huge liability for us. We know it is. We pay the settlements out. When are we going to look at that? And wouldn't we have rather spent $100 million in the 10 years that I've been on this council for fixing sidewalks uh, as opposed to continuing this? So, Bill, if you want to speak to the neighborhood prosecutors. Thank you. Um, and then, Miguel, if you could give me a sense on as we move forward to talk about a uh, report on our, our core mission and our core values and what we're good at where's that report that really finally lays out you know here's some places where you know we should be investing up front um, to prevent this continual uh, you know road rocky road broken road <laughs> Uh, to uh, these incredible payouts for the same thing over and over again. Okay. Well, thank, thank you, you very much, Ms. Thanks Hahn. Thanks time. You, you, have, you had two minutes thank and 37 you. seconds that extra was less than just Paul to Gretzka. achieve parity uh, with less your colleagues, both yeah. gender parity. Yeah. 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 Uh, so cool. now we're going to let them answer. Yes. I like, I like what the woman is in the president. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> uh, with respect to sidewalks, I know uh, Council Member Parks has much more information on that than I do. He and our office have talked about this issue. I know he's been spearheading a uh, 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 proposal to try to resolve some of those issues and maybe some liability issues, transference of some liability issues from the city to other entities. That would, I think, would go a long way if we could accomplish that. But uh, with respect to sidewalks, uh, trip and fall cases, it's a risk management issue and I think it gets down to the city's priorities. What are the core priorities? Sidewalks or street services. The city has a lot of sidewalks and uh, many hundreds if not thousands of miles. And But when there's a claims uh, or a settlement of a claim, uh, the, the department managers are supposed to make sure that that situation is corrected. 
uh, hopefully that can be done. Now, I, we may not be in the, in, the, in the budget times to do this, but uh, Mr. Santana has, uh, and I have talked about this, and I know from the county, sometimes they charge back to the departments. If you have a liability, then you're going to get charged back to that department until you fix that problem. And that's one way to incentivize them to fix the problem. Whether or not we can do that in this environment, I'm not sure, but that's certainly something that you should think about. With respect to collections, we do have uh, Ms. Cristoval here. I didn't want to speak for her program, but we've been working very closely with her. I know that collections usually collects about 80% of what's owed to the city. It's that 20% that is very difficult to collect. We've been working with uh, Office of Finance to try to come up with ways to speed that along. Recently, there was a lien program established with collections, Office of Finance. But it's still, it's not the city attorney wants to take over the world here. It used to be in our office. Pieces of it were given away. I'm not sure why that happened. It happened before we got here. We think it's an important component of our office. It's a top priority. Neighborhood prosecutors, we've lost over 100 prosecutors since July 1st of 2009. Because when our office gets cut, we have to shift them. We have to, get, we have to reduce the prosecutors and put them on the criminal side to defend the city. We are down to probably 20, up to 40. Um, and we have to maintain neighborhood prosecutors because we have uh, resolution authorities. We have requirements, so we're maintaining that plus a little bit. With respect to um, the other uh, risk management issues, I'll defer to Mr. Santana. I think the intersection you, you reference is probably a good example as to sort of systemically what doesn't work. It, the question is ultimately who's in charge um, of ad addressing that problem. And one of the things that's a challenge in the city is that everybody's in charge, so nobody's in charge. So if, if, if ultimately there was a clear accountability of whose responsibility is to reduce that particular liability and that liability would come out of their budget, then suddenly it would again go up to the top of the pile of things to be concerned about. And as part of we discussed a three-year strategy for the, uh, to, to address the deficit, it's also about addressing some of the systemic flaws in how we manage. And um, this is an area of opportunity that we could sort of adopt a different business model in so that there is a more direct accountability between these kinds of liabilities and, and ultimately uh, other priorities that departments may budget in. Thank you very much, Mr. Santana. Mr. Smith is our next uh, speaker. No, me. Yes. Very I'm good. I'm Smith. <laughs> At least for a few weeks. <laughs> I just had one question. I was, uh, some information was brought to my attention by my staff dealing with a $500,000 cut uh, relating to security at uh, this convention center. So I'd ask the convention center to come forward uh, and see. Uh, I understand their argument is that um, there's been an increase of need there, but that the dollar amounts don't jive with what you say. And so I'd like to hear their concern and ask if we could maybe con continue to um, watch this, report back on this, see if there's a way to resolve this issue. But, uh, from the point of view of the Convention Center, please. Thank you, Council Member Philip Hill, Assistant General Manager, Chief Operations Officer, Convention Center. Uh, General Services Department through Office of Public Safety provides for security and safety services at the Convention Center. Um, not getting into budget specifics, but they are, in my understanding, within the allocation for the year, but trending upward and project maybe half a million dollar potential overrun, if I understand correctly. Um, the convention center does not necessarily agree with the projection and recommends a different way to proceed. And the way to proceed, we believe, is let's not throw more money at it. Let's look at fixing the situation, the problem, and let's stay within budget to the extent that we can. We believe we can mitigate that pretty greatly. So our recommendation is let's alter our deployment levels, working with GSD, and let's uh, return back here uh, fiscal year end and, and, and give a report on how we're doing and recommendations for next steps. But initial changes will be happening basically as soon as I can get back to the convention center. We will begin mitigating immediately. Okay, do you, in the final quarter of this year, do you have any big conventions that would require, or big events that would require a lot more policing, or of that 
past us with the, the most of that show. is past. Electronic Entertainment Expo will be in the June time frame, but I believe we can mitigate quite well. And working with GSD, we can do that in a way which really does not result in a reduction of public safety. It's just a smarter way to deploy. You've kind of seen how we've done that with the convention center globally in our business. We have adapted to a business model we run as a business. We're going to do the same thing when it comes to security services, working in partnership with our GSD partner. And do you decide how the deployment is, or do they decide? We are the primary decider of deployment, but we consult with them. So, so you, we are you the basically primary. order their services, and you're saying you think you can reduce that order to match the, the budget impact is identified the 500,000. We know that we can drastically reduce the uh, the cost of services and maintain safety and security, but we will still consult with uh, GSD as they are subject matter experts. Okay. Mr. Sierra? The reason we established that number is because last year uh, GSD had to absorb in their budget uh, a similar uh, number. And um, and it resulted in an impact, disproportionate impact on that department. And so, uh, where this number was established, looking at the pattern of spending, knowing that it's headed in the same direction, mm -hmm. like like was indicated, most of, most of the big events have already happened, and so the opportunity for savings is a little bit more limited. Uh, we we'll certainly work with the department. We don't recommend making a change in the FSR, but perhaps making a, a final adjustment at the end when we close out. There'll be one more FSR before the closing out of the year, and at that point, if in fact the department finds a way of reducing I would, that. I would think, speaking as a general manager type uh, thought process, I would say to you as the general manager, it's much easier for you to take it than for me to ever get it back. Uh, so if they don't use that money, um, you're going to take it anyway at the end of the year. So their concern would be, don't take it until you need it. Is there a way we can continuously can calibrate this as we go along right. rather than taking it up front? And the, the tr same is true for GSD. I mean, GSD was short last year, and they're wanting to make sure that they're, they're struggling as well, and they're, they're getting reimbursed. The idea is that they'll be fully reimbursed. So I think somewhere in between we'll, we'll be able to figure it out. With, with regards to the convention center, with, reg with regards to the convention center um, source of funds for GSD, whatever GSD doesn't spend reverts back to the convention center budget. The concern is that the reason why we included the recommendation is because we weren't seeing an adjustment in service levels and didn't, were concerned that GSD was going to be put in the same position that they were last year. Our concern overall is to make sure that whatever services are provided by GSD, mm -hmm. that they're paid for by the convention center. And the convention center has $1.5 million in additional revenue that we've recognized. And we feel that part of that can be used for services that are justified. We can't leave the convention center without security services. Right. And I don't think that's what they're saying. They're saying they can fix that problem. You're saying let's take the money. I'm saying maybe it'd be wiser to say let's put it in, keep it in their budget, but reserve it in their budget and then draw it down as necessary rather than taking it out. Yes, there's also an additional point, council member, that that money does not exist there. That's an incorrect assessment uh, that was just placed about additional revenues being there. The convention center is already providing 2.2 million this year to the uh, to the city. We've increased that by half a million dollars. We've asked that also the $400,000 you've seen in the current fiscal year be separated. The reason is we're about to be put into a cash flow situation. So we do not have that half a million dollars. We recommend let's fix the problem and let's report back. Council member, if we take out if we take out the recommendation, then the the amount of the, the budget that's available that's left for GSD would mean that they would provide a minimum level of services. So long as the council's aware of of what GSD is able to provide and if the two departments are able to work together on an alternative plan, great. But when GSD is asked to provide any additional services, they do need to be compensated for it because otherwise they're making cuts in their own operating budget. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Convention Center will be happy to work with GSD to ensure we're beginning our mitigation measures immediately. Okay. So the, 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 then the suggestion would be that you guys will get together. We'll, we'll go ahead and go forward, but we can always come back in the final FSR. Uh, and making a final adjustment at that point if you can come up with a better plan 
and, and begin to reduce the cost factor. Our intent is that we don't want to do the half a million dollar transfer now. We want to, because we're not at budget maximum now, we want to be given the chance to be able to mitigate this and then we readdress at the end fiscal year. Okay. And so what is well, the need? Like uh, we'd like to make an additional recommendation that before GSD is requested to provide additional services, that that appropriation is made up front. Yeah. Why, why do you have to do that? I suppose it would probably have to be a report back once uh, GSD and uh, the Convention Center work together and establish those levels of services and the funding that is required. Yeah, but why do you have to take the money up front if we don't know what that level is? Well, we have an issue with uh, the Convention Center spending that money and that money being available to reimburse GSD services at the end of the year. This is what happened last year. But, uh, wait a minute. Last year we didn't have this discussion. You just did it at the end of the year because you said, okay, you went over the budget. We didn't have this discussion four months beforehand. Now we're having the discussion beforehand and saying, why do you have to take the money based on what happened last year? If they're saying we can change that and fix that, all we got to do is talk about it, then why take the money out now? Right, so correct. We just want to make sure that there are pro appropriate adjustments to uh, convention center accounts to ensure that that money is available for GSD. Uh, convention center has always uh, met any of our appropriation obligations that are there. So the bottom line is our intent is to be able to not throw money at a problem and do business as normal. Yeah. It is to fix the system, fix a broken system, and do something that works in perpetuity right. and to report back to this body with a plan that works. That's yeah. how we run our business. So why don't, why don't we just cut the appropriation down a bit and, and then you guys come back and we'll finalize it. Right. Half Mr. quarter million Mr. instead of half million for yeah, now. Yeah, why don't we and then, you come and then back work and, it out. All right. That will be my recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. Rosendahl? I certainly appreciate that, Mr. Smith, what you've said there. Uh, can I ask Pete Services to come up real quick? I know they're in the back of the room. We've got another rainstorm coming in tonight, folks, and another one after that, and then we get a free day on Saturday and another rain on Sunday. And many of us do know that we had 1,500 phone calls the other day when we had that deluge, uh, uh, the last bit of rain that ended up two, three inches. Good news about the rain is we don't have a rain issue anymore in terms of a water issue, but we certainly have a problem with potholes, and, and in my district we have puddles everywhere and this and that and everything else. Okay, big question is this. How many uh, phone calls did we get of the last rain, and have we been able to answer them all? And tie that, because I know I'm taking up a third time here. How do we take street maintenance and street resurfacing and urban forestry and have the flexibility so you can do what you need to do? Please. Good afternoon, Council Member Rosendahl. Uh, Nazario Salceda, Interim Director of the Bureau of Street Services. Since Saturday morning, we have received approximately 2,100 calls. 2,100 calls. 2,100 calls, of which 1,800 pertain to tree, are related to tree, fallen trees, fallen limbs, etc., etc. I know I had them in Brenton, the Palisades, and in West LA, Mar Vista, and, all and approximately 300 are related to street conditions. Now, um, the second part of your question, obviously, to us in the Bureau of Street Services. Emergency response supersedes anything else. Correct. We, ha we have to provide. We have to provide our residents with a safe and passable road. Right. So what we're doing right now is we are borrowing employees from the different from the different uh, divisions within the Bureau of Street Services to put together an emergency response team. Uh, in doing this, obviously, we're satisfying the needs of the residents in terms of allowing them to access their houses and doing all those things. But on the other hand, we're getting behind on our other, uh, on our other funded uh, programs, such as resurfacing, slurry, etc. Mm -hmm. So how do, we, how do we work that in the issue of our tight budget crunch here right now? Obviously, I've heard in, in, in budget and finance that if we let you keep all your money from the gas money, we might have to take across the board another furlough day. How do we work this out so we don't have to do that and yet get our work done? Well, most of your offices uh, express a lot of concerns in terms of how can we improve uh, the delivery of, of the core services. And uh, one of the solutions that we provided, one of the options that we provided to council, of course, uh, through Public Works Committee and Personnel Committee, was to utilize some of our surplus to let us work, uh, let us meet our obligation, our furlough obligation, to, uh, to, so we could work, let us pay for the obligation that we have right now in terms of the furloughs, so we can work, so we could work 
those days that were scheduled to work, those furloughs. That's what we were proposing. Let us meet, let us offset our furlough obligation by paying the $2.5 million that at that time were required in order for us to work during our furloughs. Can we get a response back, please, on that, Mr. Santana? Well, on the, you know, again, it's it's a similar conversation as the one that we're having around taking the 911 operators off of furloughs, and you know, the our ability to present solutions that resulted in no additional layoffs or furloughs came out of going through every single account. The only thing that's left really is, um, you know, a handful of items. If our goal is to maintain the reserve fund at 191, then the only things really we have left is uh, the special events fee subsidy, which is about 1.2. We need to confirm those numbers. Uh, there's uh, about $250,000 left in the fire department special training fund. Uh, or the, the, uh, the imposition of one additional furlough day for the rest of the city would basically provide enough funding to take care of taking off uh, street services as a whole off of, uh, of uh, furloughs. And so the options are, are unfortunately very limited at this time. If our intention is to maintain a healthy reserve fund and to leave the pie chart of all the solutions intact. Is that a response to that? Well, again, just let me emphasize again that we fully, in the Bureau of Street Services, we fully understand the need to balance the budget. I mean, uh, we are basically proposing an opportunity uh, of utilizing this funding that is available right now, or surplus, to provide the much needed core services that the residents are expecting at this point as a result of the emergencies that we faced uh, this week and the ones that we are anticipating by the end of this weekend. Now, how do we respond to what Mr. Santana just said is the other options that don't seem to be real other than a, well, another furlough day? The options presented by Mr. Santana, I think they, uh, they have to be decided by, by this body. I mean, these are policy decisions, and obviously it, it's a matter of balancing um, what is important, um, uh, those reserve accounts or providing services at this point to our residents directly. It's important to point out that we did recommend uh, $600,000 to take all of streets resurfacing uh, individuals off of furloughs. And so that is part of the recommendation we made before the personnel committee mm -hmm. and will be coming to your, to your body. Yeah, can we use some flexibility with personnel like for tree trimming and moving them around? Can that be done? Well, again, if we are, if we are only accepting uh, uh, employees from the resurfacing division, that creates what we call an operational um, inefficiency. Um, the Bureau of Street Services is very unique because we don't have employees who do only or perform only one duty. Uh, our employees perform okay. duties across several divisions. So if I if I was to use only or exempt only uh, employees within the resurfacing division, I'm going to face a big, big, big dilemma. Let me give you an example. Uh, I'm going to say that roughly 60% of our employees are acting, I mean, in, in, a, in a capacity above their normal job classification. So I do have a lot of employees assigned to the resurfacing division, let's say a maintenance and construction worker that is running a sweeper. And this sweeper doesn't belong to resurfacing, it belongs to maintenance. Now, if I was to exempt only my resurfacing employees, I'm going to have to bring that guy out of the sweeper, put it in resurfacing, and now I don't have anybody to run the sweeper. That's the kind of efficiencies that we run within the Bureau. I mean, it, is, uh, it would be a, 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 a task of monumental proportions to try to put everybody back again where they belong, and that would create a lot of inefficiencies in terms of the delivery of services. Um, we understand the challenges that are uh, that the street services has. Uh, the reality is every department has fi has managed to figure out a way to segregate their workforce based on those that are 100% special funded and those are general funded. And uh, the, the Bureau of Engineering is the best example of that. And so furloughs are not being applied consistently across the board because there are certain workers that that are specifically assigned to tasks related to special funds only. Um, it's, it, from my office to virtually every other department where there's a blended uh, funding source, uh, departments have had to figure out a way to segregate portions of their workforce based on the funding source so that furloughs aren't applied across the board. The, the, 
you know, streets resurfacing can be taken off of furloughs because all of that work is fully paid, can be fully paid for out of the gas tax. But street, uh, tree trimming or street sweeping, it's, it's reliant on the general fund. The, the small portion that we get compared to the larger budget. Yeah. And so um, there would have to be a different way of organizing. Okay, just two quick questions. First of all, public works, we have a board, we pay these people good money. Why aren't they here advocating for you to begin with? I mean, don't, shouldn't they be advocating for you? I cannot answer that question, uh, uh, council member. I don't know if they're here. Well, I'm just curious. I mean, we got a big group that sit around all, in, in a very serious way. I'd like them to defend you or, or to support you or not. That's question, comment one. Comment two is, I know the reserve fund is a serious thing for us, and Ms. LeBond was talking about over there in Japan. Well, you know, a lot of rains all of a sudden create issues, and there is a sense of urgency in people's minds of fixing that issue. Is there some way, some flexibility? Say, God forbid, this storm this next day is another couple of inches and causes some other issues as mudslides or this or that or with the other, or another tree goes over, you know, a, a street and, and causes a, a traffic accident, something like that. I'm just trying to balance out it's not a policy decision, it's an emergency notion about what the job is that he does there that affects all of our residents. I'm just curious. Mr. Can we Rosenbaum, get some of that? And thank you. Thank we you. wrap it up because there's some wrap it up. I'd just like and a response. Yeah, I'm going to let them answer. Great. Thank, thank you very you. much, Mr. Thank Rosenbaum. You, Please answer. Yes, I think there's another way to approach this, uh, a, a possible solution. Instead of just determining that certain division is going to get um, is going to be exempted. Maybe we should talk about classifications. I mean, instead of just saying resurfacing, let's talk about classifications. Maybe the classifications will be a better fit because this will allow me to still move people around between divisions. I think that's a better, better and more feasible option if if it's considered by by this council. Uh, Mr. Santana, um, answer? Well, answer I'll, I'll use my office as an example. Okay, the the much of the work that's produced is done th uh, through uh, administrative or management analysts, and there are classifications that cut across all sectors. Some of them, a very small handful of them, work exclusively on proprietaries and special funds. Okay, those handful of individuals are exempt from furloughs because their, their salaries are 100% paid for. If I were to take classifications only uh, of that same category, then it would cut across the entire department and even where the majority are actually paid for out of, out of uh, the general fund. So classifications is not necessarily the best way. If there was going to be an exemption, it should be around particular functions that reflect your particular priorities. If I could add, my name, John Chavez with the CAO's office. We do have another option, which it would be not only to exempt from furloughs, resurfacing, but and and pothole repair, but potentially street tree, which of course uh, happened. You know, on Monday there was a lot of trees that went down, so there is there is a cost that we've associated with that. But as uh, uh, Miguel mentioned, we are just looking at. Those divisions and those people in those, in those particular divisions, when we talk about the cost, um, and we're not c considering just exempting classifications across the board. Well, if, if, if we're able to include the maintenance and the urban forestry division, we would be more than happy to exempt those employees as well. I mean, um, uh, just confining this to the uh, resurfacing division, it, it creates a very, very tough administrative. And certainly we can manage and assign staff, uh, but once again, is resurfacing the only core service that uh, our residents are interested in right now? I think urban forestry is very critical right now. I think people want their trees in front of their houses to be removed as soon as possible. I mean, I don't think they care too much about paving right now as much as getting that tree out of, out of their driveway. So again, it, it, it is a policy decision. What else can be included? Um, maybe maintenance, maybe urban forestry, maybe resurfacing. You know your residents and your constituents better than us. All right, thank you. Mr. Labonge is our next speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, if you could write this down, Mr. Santana. Senior lead, whether it's the planner, officer, uh, public works official for the area, 
It's very important. If you, you talked about core business out of this discussion, I wanted to say senior lead, because that's the contacted community. And as Ms. Hahn spoke earlier about neighborhood councils, at the same time there's a contact that must be their senior lead planner, senior lead officer, senior lead public works representative, or whatever it is, just that deal too. For street service, you just want to ask for. Uh, and thank you for your service as street services. It is about public safety and public works. On the issue of classifications, there's something like 1,500 job classifications. Is that right? In the city, did we know that? Does anybody know that number? It's it's. I have no idea. I have no idea. Someone knows. Maggie Whalen knows the number. Yeah, I don't. I so, have no but. We should know the number, Mr. CAO, because I think that's something if we're talking to people about trying to streamline operations, classifications sometimes make it easier for managers to be able to be effective in getting the jo job, jobs done. But that's something that is so key on that issue there. I will continue my remarks at a later date, but I just wanted to say senior lead and whatever it is, if you're going to really look at core services and, and street services is core, public safety is core, have that contact so the community could, because often when we lose that, we also lose the connection to the community, which is so important. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, staff. Thank you, Mr. LaBange. Mr. Parks to close. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry, let me just mention one thing. I think the CAO and others have been pretty good in the sense of giving you about $650,000, but I think you're going to have to figure out how to spread that out and use it. And so we can't give you money across the board, across the exemptions. So we're trying to give what I think came to us as what was most important, was streets and potholes. So if you could work that out, I think it would be beneficial. Uh, one thing, colleagues, in closing, let me ask Antoinette to come up for a minute. I just don't want you to lose sight of all the good work you've done. There's a document that we passed out to everyone about collections of taxes and fees in the city. And I'd just like her to come in and tell you what success that you've had over the last several years and hope uh, that you get a sense of where we are uh, as it relates to the dollars. And also, I think if you kind of walk us through this report quickly and tell us what those headings mean. And colleagues, 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 please look at this report for this importantness to your concern about collecting the fees and what success we've had as of June 30th. Okay. Thank you, Councilman Parks, for allowing me an opportunity to speak. Um, the Office of Finance, uh, we've been in existence for about 10 years, and one of the things that I think is very important to note that since our office has been in operations, and, and, and in particular uh, business taxes, which is one of our higher yielding uh, items, uh, we have collected almost a billion dollars in taxes that otherwise would not have been collected. Uh, it's due to our tax compliance programs that we have in place. It's also due to the uh, delinquent collections uh, that we have uh, through our citywide collections unit that used to be in the city attorney's office. We have implemented a number of uh, collection programs, the top debtor program, the parking revocation program. And, and if you look at parking taxes, uh, particularly the budgeted amount that was budgeted for last year uh, in a recession period, that tax was not reduced. If you look, we actually met, met the budget revenue target. If you look at parking taxes for this fiscal year, the CAO is not recommending a reduction there because we're going to meet the revenue target. And, and a lot of it's because of the programs that we have implemented over time. Um, we also have the tax amnesty program that Councilman Park spoke about where we doubled the amount of taxes that we have collected. Um, so we have a number of programs in place. We stepped up our audit, uh, audits of taxpayers. Uh, we are uh, vigorously enforcing the tax code. And we also have on, this, on the uh, citywide side uh, a number of changes that we have made. We, we released our citywide guidelines and they're very specific about what departments are supposed to do. When the city attorney's office speaks about the city attorney letter, if you go to the citywide guidelines, that is a, rec that is a requirement of departments. They are supposed to be, uh, with their second notice, using the city attorney's letterhead. Not all departments are doing that. If departments are doing that, 
then there will definitely be an increase in collections. It doesn't need to be referred to, to the city attorney's office for that purpose because that is quite costly. A best practice is that departments should be using the city attorney's letterhead as part of their collection effort, and that's part of the citywide guidelines. It's one of the items that the core has recommended and, and asked for a report back on. I think they feel very strongly about that too, and I think it's the best practice. Uh, a couple of things I do want to report on is that there's this discussion about this half a billion dollars in debt. Um, the document before you is the city is a page from the city controller's CAFR, the financial audited statements that were audited by outside CPAs. If you look at this report, look at the uncollectible allowance for uncollectible. That is the area that uh, has constantly been brought up about uncollected debt. This is the projected uncollected debt and of course we, we can't collect 100% of everything that's billed because businesses go out of business, uh, you know, people are unable to pay their bills and, and in some cases departments are not writing off uh, a, their um, uncollectible debt or in cases of the fire department I, I, I'm very certain that there are probably uh, in the uncollectible uh, uh, column uh, amounts that really should not have been shown as an uncollectible debt because it's because of adjustments with insurance companies and the like. But the point I want to want to make here is that if you look at the, the allowance for uncollectible, uh, you have taxes receivable, you have accounts receivable. For allowance for uncollectible for taxes is 47.3 million dollars. Looking at the accounts, the taxes that are managed by the Office of Finance, our collection rate is 94 percent. And I'll repeat that, 94 percent. We have done a, a number of, of, taken a number of steps to improve collections, and I think that uh, we've made great gains here and to, re to, to transfer that back to the city attorney's office, particularly the delinquent debt, really would be going backwards and, and it's not best practice. If you look at the accounts receivable, uh, more there's $465 million that's considered uncollectible. And again, it's in the two departments that we've talked about, the fire relative ambulance billings and DOT parking fines. The fire department started referring delinquent accounts to the second to the collection agencies uh, I believe in February of 2010 and we have seen improvements in their collections but there's more work that needs to be done there. Uh, the, the average uh, billing is probably between three to four hundred dollars. Uh, that's a delinquent billing. I don't think you want the city attorney's office uh, having city attorneys uh, go after $300, $400 receivables. What happens right now is that those delinquent billings are not are referred to the collection agencies. We have primary and secondary collection agencies. They're, they're handling that collection and they are recovering their own fee. Uh, on the DOT, which represents about $184 million of that $465 million. DOT is uh, in the process of releasing an RFP because right now they use an outside uh, vendor to collect on their debt. And what they have said that they have an 85% collection rate. And so we anticipate when DOT goes forward with their new RFP, and we have mandated that the new um, whoever is, is, gets the contract, that they have to follow the citywide guidelines, which means that they need to refer the accounts to the, the primary and secondary collection agencies in addition to all the other requirements of the citywide guidelines. So my point, sir, and, and other members of, of council, is that I think it's very misleading for the city attorney's office to say that that the debt should be referred back to them. When the, when the debt was in their office, they were collecting seven to eight million dollars a year. Uh, it's around 30 million dollars a year now. It has been that way for the past three years or so. That's a 380 some odd percent improvement. And as I've said, there's more work that can be done. And we have been working very cooperatively with the city attorney's office uh, because uh, we want to make sure that they do a great job in addition to the work that's been done by my department and others. Thank you very much. Colleagues, I'd ask you to move item six uh, as reported from the budget and finance report. Thank you very much, Mr. Park. And with that, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Santana, and to all the staff people who reported today um, for uh, I think bringing we forth. <clears throat> hmm? we, have, we have one amendment that's circulated. 
Madam President, for clarification, there is a, a many motion 6A, uh, motion Garcetti Parks. All right. So we'll be voting on the entire package as amended. Uh, friendly amendment 6A. Uh, so, Mr. Does everybody have a copy of 6A? Oh, it's a friendly amendment. Okay, great. Let's open the roll then, as amended. You don't have it, Mr. Uh, Mr. Krikorian needs a copy. Let's give. Uh, believe it was distributed. Yes, it's been quite a while ago. Mr. Garcetti, why don't you speak into the mic so people can hear you? Okay. It's, it's mine. Don't, don't, don't panic. It's, uh, it's mine. It adds $150,000 to specific line item to work on collections and revenue, the stuff people were talking about, to make sure that we have the money in place for the staffing up to allow that to happen. So All right. Let's open the roll on this item. 6A. Yes. Friendly Amendment 6A. So this item we're voting on is as amended by 6A, friendly amendment. Mr. Zine. Regarding, regarding this uh, that we're going to vote on, the, uh, that we move $1.8 million in the, um, let me get it. Number two. Number two, authorize the control to transfer 1.8. 842616 from Fund 550 12 Consumer Protection Trust Fund Account A304 Consumer Protection Penalty to Fund 100 slash 12 City Attorney 1010 Salary General for Eligible Salary Expenses. So asking for, and this is from the City Attorney's Office, to transfer 1.8 from the Fund 550 slash 12 Consumer Protection Trust Fund to Consumer Protection Penalty Fund City Attorney Salary General for Eligible Salary Expenses. Are you aware of this one? Yes. Okay, yes. just as part of this particular yes. package. Do you know what it is, Rick? Yes. Can, the, the why, one's the wait, verbal. hold on just a second. Why are, Mr. Mo, Mr. Zein, are you making a motion or what are you trying to do? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm making a motion on behalf of the City Attorney for this. Uh, but can we please vote on that transfer. separate from uh, the item? I, I don't think we need to roll okay. that into this. It just complicates things. This is the verbal. Let, can let, let, you, I, I'd like to vote on 6A okay. first, and then, then let, let's we get just copies of this? open yeah. the roll on 6A, close the roll, tabulate the vote. Twelve eyes. All right. Now, Mr. Zine, you have an item up. Can we get copies of this uh, from the State Attorney's Office to distribute to the council members? Okay, Mr. Zine, what this is, this? is the Consumer Protection Trust Fund, and they're looking to transfer this money within their Consumer Protection Trust Fund, money within the City Attorney's Office. And if we can get copies, or Mr. Mr. Santana, Mr. Zine is making a proposal here or a motion on behalf of the Office of the City Attorney, and uh, since we don't have any... Uh, I think we need copies for everyone. We, first, we need a second, but I, I, we're going to also need some background, some explanation. If we can, we'll pass it out. If we I can, believe uh, it was taken out in budget and finance. Do we have a second on Mr. Mine, Mr. Zine's motion? Do you want to say it again, Mr. Zine? We're, we're going to move $1.8 million point eight in the Consumer Protection Trust Fund to the City Attorney's salary account. It's within their trust fund account with the City Attorney's Office. Miguel, can you explain the detail on that? Okay, Mr. Santana. Ben Sehel to CAO. Um, if you recall, part of the um, solutions that have been taking place up to this point have, have been taking place at the start of the, the fiscal year with the first FSR and the operational plan. One of those solutions that the city attorney identified and was approved in concept by this, by this body was to use consumer protection funds um, for reimbursements of work that the city attorney has done relative to consumer protection cases. So what this motion would do is actually move those funds from the Consumer Protection Trust Fund to the salary accounts for that purpose. So in essence, it's, it's effectuating uh, a transfer of funds that was approved in concept by this body uh, several months ago. Rick, can you? I was going to say, it's basically it's improved in concept as part of the operational plan. This is a portion of the 4.2 million that was approved as part of that that plan. How much is in that fund? 
I believe right now there's roughly about 2.8. One million uh, needs to go for actually for the budget purposes, and there is an, this 1.8 that that needs to be transferred now for actually for for 1010 salary count. So, Mr. Zahn, I have a suggestion. Uh, if we uh, could send this back to committee, if you are amenable, we do not have a second yet. And uh, uh, I, I, I just want to assure that the city attorney has the resources to do the job that they need. No, I understand, but we don't have any, we don't have any, excuse me, we don't have any fiscal impact analysis. I do believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, that it was taken out in committee and it was taken out to be in I, I, I understand. Mr. Santana wasn't. can confirm. Um, I was Mr. told it was not taken out. It, it was, it, Mr. Parks, have you seen this in your committee? It didn't come in. It came in today. It didn't come in committee, and I would suggest we send the committee to evaluate it. All right. Thank you. I thought it was already no, yeah. reviewed. Okay. Thank you very much yeah, we'll for the clarification. To send to committee. And thank you very much, Mr. Zine, for being amenable to that. Uh, Mr. Krikorian, press his button, and then I'll... Be my process. Okay, yeah, send it back to committee. Okay, great. Mr. Labonge? I was going to give Mr. Zine a second if that would help him. Well, now you can second it, and it will go back to you committee. Second? It will go to committee. Thank you very much, Mr. Zine. And uh, we'll s so we opened the roll on number six as amended. We already now we have to open the roll on six as amended, Mr. Clerk. Please open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. Twelve eyes. All right. Thank you very much, and again, thank you, Mr. Zine. Uh, what's our next item? Madam President, that brings us to uh, item number 15. All right. That'll be closed session. So if we can have the uh, admonition from the uh, city attorney. Council is going into closed session pursuant to government code section 54956.9A on the Sandra Carter versus city of Los Angeles matter. All right. If we can clear the chamber, uh, we're going into closed session. Officers will help us uh, clear the chamber once once we are secure closed session can begin and members just to let you know that in just a few minutes we will be at uh, Bear Quorum Two of our members are excused to leave at 1 30 
In about two hours, we'll have it all finished. The grass will be in, and then you'll be able to come out here and enjoy yourself and right. really have a lot of fun in your garden. It looks beautiful. Good. Julie, I think you did a great job of selecting this fountain, you and Kevin. And the nice thing about it is it really fits well to the scale of the garden, but also it's a very low water using fountain, very efficient as well. Mm -hmm. Also in the back, you've noticed that we planted some coral bells that kind of fill in some of the large areas. And these are a very beautiful plant, again, with the Ceanothus, all California natives, that really add a, a tremendous amount of color. It's going to make this outdoor living space very spectacular. As these plants develop their flowers in the spring, and with the contrast with the um, Ceanothus and the vines that we have espaliered or spread out over this cedar fence, all this contrast is really going to make this backyard pop it's going to be really exciting to come back out here and entertain and just have a wonderful time enjoying the, this beautiful outdoor room, which is a California-friendly landscape. This is our final phase, and in about two hours from now, you'll see all of this grass, this warm season grass, which we recommend in the California-friendly landscape, installed under my feet. It's now been two weeks since Kevin and Julie began their garden makeover. The couple wanted their outdoor space to become a water-wise garden that was neat and easy to maintain, provided more room for the children to play, and gave them more room for entertaining. Did they get what they wanted? Let's have a look. Two weeks ago, the front of Kevin and Julie's house used to look like this. Today. The front yard is a peaceful, luscious showcase of California's most water-efficient plants. From drought-resistant grass, All right, let me know when we're back. All right, thank you very much, members. We are back in open session now. Mr. Clerk, what is our next order of business? Madam President, Council has motions for posting and referral. Motions are posted and referred. There are excuses on the desk.
Mm -hmm. Council Member Zine requests to leave at 11.30 on April 6th due to city business. That means Council Policy. Great, without objection. Council Member Cardenas requests to leave at 12.15 on March 30th due to city business. That means Council Policy. Again, without objection. Council Member Rosendahl requests to leave at 11.30 on April 15th due to city business. That means Council Policy. That's fine, without objection. Council Member Weezar requests to be uh, excused on June 28th and 29th as well as July 1 and 5 due to personal business. That means Council Policy. All right, thanks. That's without objection. What's our next order of business? Uh, the desk is clear. All right. Members, are there any announcements? Mr. Rosenbaum, do you have an announcement? Uh, no, Ms. Taylor. Okay. All right. Why don't we all rise for adjourning motions, please? I think a number of uh, the members wanted to say a few words about Elizabeth Taylor. Uh, so why don't we take that first? Uh, Mr. Labange, Mr. Taylor, Taylor, just a great actress, but as a person, her, her fight uh, through life in most recent years in joining in the awareness of AIDS, HIV, and the fight uh, to cure people, all that she has done has truly uh, uh, led her to get the, the Jean Hutchinson uh, um, uh, Award for Humanitarianism from her peers. Uh, she truly was a very special person as an actress, as a young actress. In all her ways, she was remarkable and loved by many, and I know we're all going to join and say words. Mr. Rosendahl, I know you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. LeBron. This will be in all members' uh, resolutions. So, Mr. Rosendahl, Ms. Hahn, I think you wanted to say a few words, and then we'll go around the yeah. circle again. Um, you know, when John Warner was uh, running for the United States Senate, Liz Taylor was married to him, and, and Liz reached out to me because I was running the campaign for Henry Howell, who was running for governor uh, that year before in the state of Virginia. And so we spent some time together, and we talked about what role she would play uh, for her husband in, in that contest. Of course, he won and she did uh, give him a lot of support and help make it. But my real relationship with her is from the gay community over the years. You know, when AIDS first came out, everybody ran to the hills. I lost my lover. All kinds of people died. It was a holocaust that we will never forget, those of us who lived from 80 to, to the mid-90s when all of the deaths started to happen. When, when uh, uh, Rock Hudson died, uh, it was a breakthrough really for us because all of a sudden somebody who was famous and well-known and loved had passed on and she jumped in there and became one of our leading champions and stayed focused on that even to the days as she was in a wheelchair toward the end of her life she was fighting not just for HIV but for gay rights uh, she was a terrific lady uh, she was a very warm personable person who put herself out on the line and she passed away this morning may she rest in peace Right, Ms. Hahn. Yeah. Well, thanks. You know, again, she was just such a uh, one of the um, really from the old, uh, you know, old school Hollywood glamour uh, royalty uh, with those violet eyes. Uh, she had such a her her, her uh, acting career, her movie career really stood on its own. She received two Academy uh, awards uh, for her performances, but um, you know she really uh, changed, I think, America's and, and possibly the world's view uh, of the HIV AIDS uh, epidemic uh, in this, uh, you know, country, in this world. And uh, Bill, you were talking about Rock Hudson. And this morning, uh, when the, all the tributes were being aired on the morning shows, um, they, they were remembering that uh, when... Rock Hudson was first diagnosed with this disease. Then we knew nothing about it. People were afraid of people with AIDS. They didn't want to touch people with AIDS. And Elizabeth Taylor uh, took Rock Hudson's hand uh, and held his hand in, fr in front of the, the world. And they were saying how that completely changed people's perception of what you, you could and couldn't do. And it really moved us forward uh, to treating uh, people with AIDS uh, with dignity and respect. And she truly was a, a champion um, and a voice for, for so many of the voiceless. A great actress. Uh, I had an aunt who called her La Liz because she was just uh, so, so gorgeous and so dramatic uh, in her public career and in her private life. We will miss her. Members, just to let you know that uh, we're going to have to adjourn for lack of a quorum no, right now. Um, so appreciate your words, and then we can take action on them uh, tomorrow.
if other people would like to Friday I'm sorry Friday uh, if other people would like to read their journey motions into the record otherwise we can do them on Friday okay so Mr.